Good evening all, and welcome. Before the video begins, I'd like to give a special birthday shout out to Kelsey. I hope you've had a wonderful day. Don't forget to please check out my Instagram and Twitter for some big things that are coming soon. You'll want to be informed. But without further ado, it's time to get comfortable and let the darkness take control. I'm a big outdoorsman from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. So of course, when I decided to go to college, I had to keep in mind that having some decent woods nearby was a must. Upon checking a couple of places out, I decided to go to Edinburgh University of Pennsylvania, or just the borough. The biggest plus about going to that university is that my uncle Fred lived up there and was a well known name in the community. He owns to this day, a framing shop right in the middle of the small town area. This was a huge plus since knowing people like that always equals more land to put spots in. That's all I really needed to pick the college I would be going to. Edinburgh is really cool because there are lots of old buildings and strange flat landscapes as compared to the hilly land around Pittsburgh. So it was cool to figure out how to scout the game that I'd be going after once the season started. My main hunting area was directly behind my uncle's house. He has a beautiful log cabin that sits back off the road with woods on all sides of it. It was truly a thing of beauty. When he had the house built, he actually had the gigantic chimney made of flat stones that we found in the woods behind the house. As I was scouting the area for the first time, I came up on a few different circles of boulders in the middle of the woods. They were definitely very old. The boulders were quite big, much too big just to be moved there for some reason, like a group of guys came camping out. They must have taken at least 10 men to move, and only if they'd have had some kind of pulley system or something. There were also smaller rocks. And when I say smaller, I'm talking like somewhere around 300 pounds or more, making inner circles inside of the large boulders. I found a total of seven of these stands throughout the property. Some of the rocks that were now part of the chimney. They simply had to be with the amount of rocks he used on them. Oh, and also these rock circles had made a much larger circle around the woods. After a few more days of scouting with my buddy Brandon, we were sure we had our spot picked out for our first day of archery. We couldn't wait to get out there. Perfect day too. It was great. The thing about Edinburgh is that it gets more snow per year than most of Alaska, due to the lake effect snow coming across Lake Erie. What happens is before the lake freezes completely over, the water which is warmer than the air pushes the clouds way up high into the atmosphere, too high for them to actually snow due to the low temperature all the way up there. The clouds then come inland and fall back towards Earth. It takes them about 20 miles to do this and Edinburgh is about 20 miles from the lake. You see what I'm saying. Anyway, on the first day of archery, which is in the first week of October in Pennsylvania, there was a thin layer of snow. This is perfect for archery, because you can see deer in the woods much more easily. And you can also see if any animal has left any tracks. If they did, they were fresh since the snow didn't happen too long before that. In our trees for about two hours or so, neither of us had seen anything. I had just gotten off the radio with Brandon, who was on the other side of the property, when I see some movement over to my right of the pine thicket. I then see a branch move a little bit, and see four deer legs underneath. I readied my bow and my stance, as to make a good clean shot at the deer. Around 15 feet up in a tree, I did this very carefully. About a minute later, as I was looking for any movement, 
I lost the four legs inside the thicket. This was expected due to the fact that where the deer would have been is a common feeding area for them. So I waited. Maybe another minute or so later, I caught movement again. It looked as if the deer would break through the thicket into more open woods. The movement I've been waiting for. As I brought the bow up into a full drawn stance, I was stunned by what I was seeing. Where the deer should have been, there was a man. A strange man at that. This absolutely should not have been. If there was a man anywhere near where that deer had been, the deer would have been long gone, spooked back into the thicket. I put my bow back down onto the hook that I screwed into the tree and lifted my binoculars to my eyes. At only 35 yards away, I could now see in great detail his physical appearance. He was rather rotund, with his belly leading the way. A white, long-sleeved shirt, on with ruffles down the middle, just like the pirate shirt in that one episode of Seinfeld, if any of you have indulged. It was tucked into thick canvas brown pants, with pants being tucked into white socks directly below his knees. Further down where his shoes should be, there was absolutely nothing. He had no feet whatsoever, no calves, no shins, no shoes. And with my eyes wide open, I mouthed to myself, what the hell? Instead of walking, he seemed to float through the woods, going from right to left. This is when I started noticing other extremely strange things about him. I looked through the binoculars at his head. It was cocked back with his chin resting down on his lower neck. His very large, red, bulbous nose up in the air. A bit of a snobby overall look. The hair though. It was covered by a wig that judges in England wear. A white wig with three curls on the side of it, where his ears would have been. I noticed that he didn't seem to float through the woods. He was floating through the woods. His arms stayed tucked at his sides, unmoving as he traveled. He also never looked down. The way his head was cocked, he could have only been looking upwards. This is not any personal animal, as they'd be constantly looking down and around for obstacles that you might trip over. All of this happened within a period of about 20 seconds. He had come out of the thicket behind a medium sized oak tree. Then when he hit the next oak, he never came out from behind it. I watched in absolute astonishment for another five seconds waiting for him to break his cover so that I could see him again. This never happened. I told Brandon what had just happened and was immediately made fun of. I expected that was what would be coming through the radio after I got done talking. He was just saying I should have taken a picture of the only deer slash human or minotaur remaining in the world. I told him he won't be laughing when the deer tour came over to his tree stand and smacked his ass right out of it. Even though it was in the middle of the hunt, I had to get down and see what the hell just happened. I knew where he would have walked. Not only would I see his footprints in the snow, but it would have also been very easy to see even better tracks due to the fact the area we were in was full of muddy ground. A freaking hummingbird would have left tracks in this muddy mess. As you probably guessed, when I go over to the spot where he had been, there was nothing. I saw not a single track from him, nor deer, nor anything. I was utterly amazed. What happened later that night was just as creepy. So after I was done checking out the muddy snow ground where the man should have left some kind of footprint, I went back to my tree stand and climbed back up to the height that I'd been hunting from earlier. I radioed Brandon and told him I was back up the tree and secure. We always did this as a precaution. In case something happened while we were climbing the tree, or securing the platform of the portable tree stand. My old man's buddy, Bunky, 
actually saved his left eye from being completely blind and useless. He was practicing shooting from a raised platform when he slipped and fell off, driving a stick right into his eyeball as he hit the ground. This has nothing to do with the story, but all of you hunters out there should adopt this practice. You know, the more you know. Anyway, we're hunting the rest of the day but not without periodic raging from Brandon, making fun of me and the deer tool throughout the rest of the hunt. I knew I'd be hearing about it for at least a week or longer. That is, of course, if the rest of the night would have been a normal one, which as it turns out, it was not. As twilight approached, I radioed Brandon and told him I was going to start getting out of the tree. Brandon was actually in a built stand that we found while scouting in the months prior. So I had him meet me at my spot due to the fact it was going to take me much longer to get my stand down and off the tree. Just as I thought, Brandon was walking up to my spot right as I was getting to the bottom of the tree. Once I got all the way to the bottom, I unhooked the straps that were around my feet, jumped down to the ground and started feverishly explaining to him everything that happened. I took him over to the muddy area to show him that there were absolutely no tracks in the snow or mud. I definitely could sense he didn't completely believe everything I was telling him. I was able to sense this so easily because he looked right at me with his mouth agape and his eyebrows pushing up towards the middle of his forward and said, are you messing with me, brother? He was also able to tell that I wasn't messing with him. When I looked at him in what I'm sure are some of the craziest eyes he's ever seen and said, hell no. When he realized I was 100% serious, he started taking inventory of all the things that I had previously told him. And we went back and forth trying to make any kind of sense of what I had witnessed. While we were talking to each other back and forth, we had failed to notice that nighttime was already upon us. It was that Stephen King full dark no stars kind of night too, due to the fact that we were looking for signs left behind from the ghost guy. We were in a patch of woods that we weren't very familiar with. We may have been pretty close to where my stand was, but once night falls in the woods, it's a whole new ball game. Still, the patch of woods we were in was enclosed by a triangle of roads. All we had to do was walk in a straight line and we could come out somewhere on one of the roads, then just walk that road back to my uncle's house. So we began walking. Walking in a straight line in the woods is almost impossible without a compass, which I didn't have. So we were both figuratively and literally in the dark when it came to where we were. A couple of minutes into the walk, we heard a loud scream, as if someone were being murdered. Now I know what every animal in the wood around here sounds like, both normally or in panic mode making death cries. I see videos often on YouTube of people recording a sound in their backyard that they think is a person who needs help, only to be a rabbit screaming from being attacked by some predator. This was not that at all. After waiting a couple of minutes to see if the screaming would continue, we started walking again in the direction we thought we should be going. We didn't talk much about what we had just heard, probably because of the anxiety we were both feeling. We couldn't ignore it for long though, because we heard another long blood curdling scream. It was closer this time and sounded different. At first we thought it sounded like a woman being attacked. This new scream sounded threatening. Ironically, we felt like we were the ones being stalked and hunted at this point, and we still pushed forwards. After walking another hundred yards or so, we came across something very strange directly in our path. There were these weird, clear gelatinous masses on the top of leaf litter. Now I'm at 32 which isn't an age that necessarily screams wisdom from my experience, but I've been in the woods since as far back as I can even remember. My old man taught me everything there is to know about the wilderness around us. So take it from me. 
These clear globs should not have been there. The only thing I could think of was that it was tree sap, but it wasn't. I poked one of the masses with a stick, fearing what they were made of. I had read a story about a town that had clear gelatinous globs rain down on them. A lot of these people got very sick. And if I'm not mistaken, I think even a couple of them perished from it. So needless to say, I was taking precautions. Their consistency was that of a thick gelatin. Like if you made jello with only one cup of water instead of two. Once we started walking again, we came across a good amount of this stuff. It wasn't all over the woods. Instead, it was directly in front of us as we walked, almost like something or someone knew which route we would try and take and marked it with these globs. Then came another scream, this time even closer and with a little something added in. This time, not too far away from us, we heard leaves rustling and a couple of twigs snap. Something was definitely there. It could have been a deer, but this was unlikely. Whatever it was, wasn't spooked at all. Not from us or the threatening scream. It's easy to tell when you've spooked an animal when they start running. On top of that, most of the leaves were still very moist, therefore not making as much noise as they normally would. This sent our anxiety level through the roof. At that point, the only thing that was on our mind was getting the hell out of there. We were no longer curious about floating men, screams or alien jelly. We just wanted out, which should have been very soon. The distance we walked should have come across a road by now, but we hadn't yet. Stranger still, we couldn't see any houses or street lights, but still we kept going thinking we'd find our way out very soon. Our flashlights were now beginning to die. So we were definitely in a hurry. Which by the way, is not what you should do if you were ever even lost in the woods. Cool heads always prevail in this situation. As we were walking, we started to see some pine trees. This was very strange, because we had thoroughly scouted the land. The only pine trees were over near my stand where we started. After seeing a few more, we got that foreboding feeling almost like a sick, anxious panic feeling. We stopped for a minute to check our surroundings and found that the exact spot that we stopped was the same spot we started. We were standing right next to a pine tree with a dead pine next to it that had a branch broken off and dangling still from the severed limb. How could this be? We had been sure we were walking in a straight line. But that must have been an impossibility, since we made a circle. We had no idea whatsoever how this happened, especially since we were in the exact spot we started from. Also very strange, we had seen my tree stand that was still hanging on the tree. It was very close to us. But when we started to walk out, it was nowhere to be found. We walked over to it and immediately found the trail that we had to take to leave the woods. It led directly back to my uncle's backyard. The trail actually went right past the live pine tree we had been standing under. There is no way we had missed that from the start. To add more to the strangeness, as we walked only about 20 yards down the trail, we see plainly my uncle's light that he had above his garage to illuminate his driveway. Our minds were blown, but at least we were able to get out. On the last hundred yards of the trail, we found more clear gelatin blobs directly down the middle of the pass. This was definitely crazy. They were not there when we walked in. We had both been on the trail when we entered the woods and we would have seen them for sure. We heard no more screams after the time we heard the rustling of the leaves and the twigs break. But we had a strong feeling of being watched when we were still in the woods, and an even stronger version of the same feeling as we stepped onto my uncle's backyard. This is at the top of my list for scariest experiences in the woods. 
I've no explanation for any part of it. Not the floating ghost guy, not the screams or the globs, not the getting lost in the woods, and not the circle of boulders. I would love to hear from anyone who has had anything like this happen to them. There has to be some kind of answer. But at this point, all I have is my story about what happened that night. And thankfully, one other person who went with me through it. At least he's been able to validate what happened to people that don't believe this actually happened to us. Whether you believe it or not is up to you. But I can assure you this. It happened exactly as you heard it. I know it sounds crazy and outlandish, but it happened. And that's a scary thing to think about next time you guys find yourselves in the woods. Something incredible had happened back there. I'm thankful that we were able to get out of the woods without having anything bad happen to us. What it did was made my wanting to understand the paranormal even stronger. One day I'm going to go back there alone and camp for a night or two in the hopes that something happens again and that I have the strength to seek out whatever it was and get some answers. A few years ago, my dad, my brother-in-law, my best friend and myself were tasked with refueling a group of eight that was hiking the John Muir Trail. For some reason, we were recommended a trail that would be a shortcut and only six miles to the lake that would become our base camp. We later found out it was about 6,700 feet of elevation gain. The trail starts off on the eastern side of the Sierras, which is essentially the desert. So in order to beat the August heat, we started on the trail at 3 a.m. Our packs were all loaded, tipping the scales at over 50 pounds each, which was our gear, food, and weak supply of food for the eight we were refueling. The first couple of miles were made up of super sandy switchbacks. By the time the sun came up, we were all out of water, despite the fact that we had packed extra, because we knew there wasn't a source for the first few miles. As dehydration started to set in, we encountered a small section, maybe a hundred yards of trail that was almost completely washed out. The main issue was that it was only about 12 inches wide of slippery granite with a vertical wall on one side and an easily 500 foot drop straight to the valley floor on the other. This was the first point on the hike where I feared for our lives, but we made it. Once we passed this point, we entered the tree line and found a creek for water. We kept moving up what seemed to be vertical trail for the next few hours until we reached a meadow and another source of water. We came across a guy who told us he had just found a dead body and apparent suicide in a tent just up the trail. Creeped out, we pumped our water filters as fast as we could and continued up the trail. For the next few hours, we marched up switchbacks until the point that I heard my dad, who had fallen a little behind, scream out for me. I dropped my pack and sprinted on my noodle legs back down the trail where I found him. He was curled up in the fetal position in a puddle of his own vomit. He kept saying he wanted to take a quick nap and I thought for sure I was going to watch him pass there. After regathering ourselves and letting him rest for a bit, we started to move again. At this point, we were once again low on water, but the map indicated we were fairly close to a lake. I kid you not. When we finally got to the lake, it was completely dry. We continued on to our resting point, only to find that my brother-in-law, as he moved quicker while I stayed with my dad, was nearly incapacitated because he sprained his knee. We all slept like logs, and the next day my dad and I hiked the other group supplies the final leg of the trail to the rendezvous point, while the other two stayed back at base camp because of the knee sprain. On our way to the rendezvous point, we crossed paths with three guys 
who looked like they'd come straight out of the 70s. They informed us the trail we were coming up on is really only recommended for going out. The three of us then proceeded to strip down, frolic and sunbathe at Base Camp Lake as we moved up the trail. After our whole crap storm of a backpacking trip, we get back to the trailhead where we find my dad's car won't start and won't take a jump from the car we had taken, and ended up needing an alternator. The good news is that we were able to refuel the other group, and we all survived. However, we collectively look back at this near-death experience, and words will never truly explain what happened. Back in 2008, I was a student planning to go to university and needed some extracurricular stuff I could put on my entry applications. As most UK students know, one of the best to have on there is the Duke of Edinburgh Award. As part of this award, you have to embark on an orienteering expedition, basically a long trek through woodland and rural villages, following nothing but a map and compass. No GPS allowed. It's a teamwork experience, and you camp and overcome hurdles together. I was out of shape at the time, and so my uncle volunteered to take me out to the middle of nowhere to get some idea of what orienteering was like. We didn't stay out overnight, like what I would have done during the real thing, but we hiked maybe 10 miles through woods in a small village in pretty abysmal weather. By the end of the journey, we were soaked to the bone and pretty miserable, looking forward to getting back in the car and heading home. For the last part of the journey, we were on a dirt trail heading uphill, with bushes and trees on either side. We were marching onwards in silence at this point, when all of a sudden, there was a rustling in the foliage to our left. From behind a large bush stepped an old man in a black suit with a red bow tie and dress shoes. He appeared to be in his late 70s to early 80s, very pale with liver spots dotting his face and a grey white comb over. I was instantly weirded out. Who dresses like that and goes into the woods? The instant thought seeing a guy his age out there in those clothes in this weather was that he had lost his marbles. There was something else that took me an extra moment to notice that puzzled me. The guy was bone dry, didn't even have mud on his shoes. We stopped in our tracks and just stared at the man for a moment, who appeared to be as frozen and shocked as seeing us as we were for seeing him. My uncle made the first move, taking a step towards him, asking him if he was alright. The old man continued to stare for a moment, not moving even a twitch, then became suddenly very animated. It was like he suddenly snapped out of a trance. He started flailing his arms wildly, saying something awful had happened, and that a good friend of his needed help. He began walking backwards into the woods, motioning for us to follow him, which we did. We started off at a brisk walk, then escalated to running as we struggled to keep up with the old man. After perhaps a minute, he disappeared ahead of us, but we could hear him, so continued to follow the noise until we reached a huge slope. We stopped at the edge, and looked down to see the old man standing at the bottom, motioning us, pleading with us to follow him. I remember looking down at the slope that was presumably at a 40 degree angle, spanned for perhaps 50 feet or more, and slick with mud. It looked like an accident waiting to happen, especially given that there were no shrubs or roots to hold onto. I remember looking down at the old man on the other side of the slope, and wondering how the heck did he cross that so cleanly and quickly. I mean, all that distance is hard to see fine detail clearly, but I swear he still did not appear to be wet or muddy in the slightest. Me and my uncle looked at each other, 
and I saw that he was getting weirded out, as was I. Despite my feelings, I made a step towards the edge, and was going to try and make my way down this, when my uncle grabbed me firmly by the arm and pulled me back. Under his breath, he said to me, Something's wrong here. We took a few steps back from the edge at this point, and the old man at the bottom started getting irate. He began pleading with us to come down the slope, telling us he needed our help. His friend was in trouble. My uncle shouted down to the old man that we would head back to our car and call the emergency services for him, that professional help would be on its way soon, and that they would have all the tools they needed. The old man suddenly got furious. He began jumping up and down, demanding that we come down the slope right now or there would be hell to pay. His voice has drastically changed. He was practically growling his words, his hands bunched up into fists, pounding his knees like an angry schoolboy throwing a tantrum. I've never seen a fully grown adult fly into such a rage in my life. His eyes looked like they were on the verge of bursting out their sockets. His skin gone from pale to red in almost an instant. We began to hurriedly make our way back the way we came. His demands and threats getting less audible as we got closer to the trail. Once on the trail, we practically power marched the remaining quarter of a mile or so to the car. All the while, my uncle was on the phone to the emergency services, explaining to them that there was a possible mentally ill old man wandering the trail. We were ordered to get into our car and await the police, so that we could show them where we had encountered him. An hour later, we met four officers, two of whom had dogs with them, and packs of supplies like first aid, emergency blankets and the like. We led them to the exact spot, and then pointed to the two officers with dogs in the direction he led us through the bushes. The search lasted all weekend, but there was no trace of the old man. Officers said the only trail they could pick up had been mine and my uncle's. They didn't find any footprints or anything belonging to the old man we encountered. This has been one of my weirdest experiences to date. This happened to my father-in-law 10 years ago at our hunting camp in Alabama. It popped into my head as we were heading there tomorrow for a few days of deer hunting, and he told me to go ahead and share his story. As some people probably know, we get out an hour or so before light and climb into a tree stand, a ladder leading up to a seat in a tree usually fairly deep in the woods to hunt. This foggy morning, my father-in-law had been in his stand for a few hours, and it was getting light, and he was reading a book as he waited for something to happen. Out of the fog, he hears a woman's voice, much closer than anyone should have been to him at the time. She's calling, Hunter, oh Hunter. Very sing-songy, like a mother calling her child in for dinner as he played outside. Now, as I said, he is pretty deep in the woods, and there are sticks and dried leaves everywhere. You generally make a pretty good racket getting to your stand, which is why we go out so early. Not only that, but in order to know where he was and spot him camouflaged in a tree, she must have seen his light when he walked out followed him into the woods, and waited hours before calling him. His first thought was that maybe the woman was calling someone called Hunter, perhaps her son. She called again, Hunter, oh Hunter, and he realized that he is the hunter. So he turns around, peers around the trees, and sees a young woman, she, in very few words and halting speech, explains that something is wrong with her hot water heater, 
and asks if he can come and have a look. Now, the strangeness of the situation hadn't set in yet, and he's a give the shirt off his back kind of guy. Not to mention he's six foot two, nearing 300 pounds and has a gun. So he wasn't too worried about this small woman and starts getting down the tree to go have a look. He follows her back to her mobile home, which borders our hunting land, probably a 10 minute walk away. She walks inside and leaves the door open. He's trailing behind a little, so he gets to the door, kind of knocks and sticks his head in and says hello. Where he entered is a laundry room, and he can see there in the room is a hot water heater, and water is just pouring out the valve at the bottom, just absolutely pouring onto the floor. He walks over, turns the valve off, sticks his head in the house to say hello, and nothing. No one answers. The house seemed empty. Empty of people anyway, but it was a disaster inside. At this point, he's starting to see how strange it all is and decides that this is just the sort of situation that could get you robbed or worse and nopes the hell out of there and hurried back to our cabin. Now, we have hunted in this land for years since and have never seen anyone at this place. Although until this season, it has shown obvious signs have been lifted. So every time I pass by her place, which backs up right to the road we take to our hunting stands. I think lady in the trailer with the messed up plumbing, who may or may not have had nefarious intentions for my father-in-law. Please, let's never meet. For starters, this is a story from my mother's side of the family, from the early 1900s in rural eastern Ukraine, told by my great-great-grandmother. When my great-great-grandmother was a teenager, she and some family friends went briefly traveling. I can't remember the why, but that's not relevant to this story. They traveled by horse at the time, so it would take quite a while, obviously requiring camping throughout the whole ordeal. One night, the traveling company laid a camp in a steep near a forest and stationed their horses right by the campsite. It was quite deep into the night, and when my great-great-grandmother was awoken by the wind noises and the rambling of horses, which were clearly unnerved by something, as being a village girl, she knew she had to check it out. And as she got out of the tent and walked towards the horses, among the low, steep vegetation, she noticed a figure. It was smaller than her and was very hairy, with clear human traces. It was bipedal, kind of resembled an old man and had very long hairy arms. The horses then calmed down and it walked away. Growing up and listening to Slavic folk tales, this didn't strike me as spooky, but more as magic and mysterious in a culturally occult kind of way, if you get what I'm saying. My grandfather spent some time researching about it, as most people from this side of the family have always had a lot of interest in paranormal phenomenon. Anyway, people said it was a leshi, a protective spirit of the woods, or perhaps a domolvoi, a protective spirit of the household. The latter doesn't seem convincing to me as it was in the middle of nowhere. Basically, my guess is that it was a polvic. Now in Slavic mythology, these are field spirits that appear as deformed dwarves with different color eyes and grass instead of hair. Any European folklore always has very particular vibes to me. It was mysterious yet blissful. How do you see these beings? Like literal nature creations, ancient humanoids, fey energy spirits? Very strange. Me and my younger sister had this huge open field behind our house. The space was seemingly endless, and we would often spend our summers and vacations 
exploring all the back fields. These fields went on for a while, and I'd say after about three miles, led to some decently sized hills. We often would enjoy hiking, just because there was nothing better to do where we lived. When this story occurred, I was only 14 and my sister 11. It was your average Saturday. And we had packed up our picnic as making it was half the fun. And we're going to find a decent spot to eat it at while making our way through the fields. Both my parents had extremely demanding jobs. My mother worked on Saturdays all day pretty much. And my dad had more work to catch up on. So he'd be home plowing away on his laptop while we would go out. There's no cell phone service a little further past our house. So our phones were pretty much useless. But we took them just in case through some sort of miracle that we got signal and in case of an emergency. It was your average day. We'd walked past the fields and gotten to the hills. That's when we went a different route. My sister said that she saw something on the floor, something shiny. We made our way and found a little less traveled path. We'd never come this way. I don't know why we just never decided to explore this part. She tells me that she wants to go this way as the shiny thing had brought her luck. And this way was the right way to go. When she showed me what she'd found, it appeared to be a chip, the likes of which you might see inside a phone or a computer. So someone had obviously broken something and scattered whatever electronic device this was all around the woods, which is weird enough. We carried on with our hike, my sister leading. And the path became even more ruggedy as the hills got steeper going up and down. Part of the fun for me was going to places I didn't know. But something about this hike made me feel uneasy. I wasn't entirely sure what. But my sister seemed happy. So I followed her without complaint. We'd been gone for at least four hours now. And as anyone who's hiked knows, four hours of walking and hiking will certainly make your stomach grumble. I tell my sister that I'm hungry and to eat the sandwiches and snacks that we had packed. We look around for a decent place to eat, perhaps a log or a rock. But right now there didn't seem to be anything as comfortable. We carried on for approximately five minutes before we found a decently sized fallen log that we could comfortably sit on. My sister pulled out the sandwiches and snacks from my backpack, got the drinks, and we started chatting, eating, and generally having a good time. This spot where we had stopped wasn't anything special. But as we spoke, I heard something strange. I asked her to stop munching for a moment. And I heard a sound like the snapping of a twig. I looked frantically in all directions, but was met with nothing. There was a slight echo to the sound too, a reverberance that made me shudder. I looked around again. The sound seemed to be coming from a bit further down directly below us. We were almost at the crest of a hill. And we couldn't see far down, especially not to where this was. But as we looked down, we could see that it was easy enough to go down and investigate the source of this sound. I was curious, but my sister didn't want to come. She said it sounded scary, like something was biting bones. I laughed at her, told her she was being ridiculous, but had no intention of going off in a hurry as my sandwich was still half eaten. And I had a cereal bar and more snacks to devour before I even thought about moving from my spot. About 20 minutes had passed and the sound by this point had stopped. I was still curious and begged my sister to come with me. She refused 
and so I started making my way round. And when she realised how far I was, did she scream that she was coming too, and chase after me? We make our way down, and this is when we see the opening of a small cave, almost like a crack in the stone of this hillside. We look at each other. I pull out my phone and illuminate with a flashlight the crevice-like space. We inch closer, being very careful to walk quietly as to not spook whatever was making that sound. By this point, I just thought it was an animal. And where we live, we don't have anything dangerous, so I wasn't worried. I was just interested to see what there was. I poke my phone in further, peering, trying as hard as I can to focus in the dark. And as we get closer, I notice that the cave is actually larger than I'd expected. My sister holds my hand in fright as we make our way into the darkness. I flash around, but my phone light isn't very strong and only illuminates a little bit ahead of us. I listen, and there's a rustling in the back. My sister squeaks the sound frightening her and tugs on my arm that she wants to leave, but I pull back and with a look, tell her that I want to keep going. The ground was ordinary, and after a few steps, do we crunch with our feet and look down. There was a small animal bone on the ground. My sister goes, Ew! and pulls me again, insisting that we leave. I shine my phone around one more time, this cave is big, and it's not worth upsetting my sister to explore it. Maybe I'll come another day alone, I think to myself. I let her pull me away, and that's when she stops. I heard it too. Something made a sound in the cave. I turn my flashlight in that direction. When I see a man stand, he is completely naked. Although I couldn't make everything out in high detail, as, like I said, the illumination from my phone isn't the best. We stand there frozen for a second before my sister jolts me and we run. The man just stands there. When we reach the mouth of the cave, which is only wide enough for one person to go through at a time, my heart is thumping out my chest. I push my sister through, and in the moment I have to spare as her butt is going up, I turn around and look at him. He's still standing there from his perch, looking at us. I just about crap myself, scream, and we run for about 20 minutes straight, before my sister breaks down crying and scolds me, telling me that we should have never have gone in there. When we get home, fatigued and annoyed at each other, we both rush to tell my dad what happened. I tell him what we saw and as does my sister, she also saying how important it was to know that it was my idea to go in there in the first place. My dad didn't believe us. He said there's no reason for a man to be hiding in a cave and kind of dismissed us and shooed us away. And that was that. We went to bed that night, sulky that our dad didn't believe us. But the next day in the morning, as we're having breakfast, a police car shows up. The police officer sits us down and asks us a few questions pertaining to what we saw. We give him a vague idea of where this cave was and tell him about the man that was naked and the fact that we'd stepped on bones. He gives me a worried look, says thank you for my help, and is off. It turns out my dad called the police, as he was worried, and just didn't want to frighten us by believing our story, and admitted to this later that day. A few weeks later, we see on the news that a man has been caught. I didn't know if it was him or not, but they mentioned that he'd been living out in the woods 
and avoiding police capture for about three months. He was wanted for the murder of his mother. I'm so glad that we ran when we did, and I will always regret putting my sister and myself in that danger. Were we close to death? I suppose I'll never know, but I am very glad indeed that we didn't have the opportunity to find out. I've had a few experiences. The first was driving to my friend's ranch for a New Year's Eve party. This was down in Eagles Pass near the Texas Mexico border. It was pouring rain and I was creeping down a back road with my high beams on. Something jumped in front of my truck, stopped for a second and then darted back into the woods. It was about three feet tall, white and briefly stood on two legs. I'm pretty sure Gollum lives in South Texas and it freaked me the hell out. The second, an abandoned and torn up tent in the outback of Australia. On our road trip up the west coast, we took a little detour inland near Carnarvon to see the red sands and such. We went down a dirt road with nothing for miles and we found a tent. We hesitantly approached it and saw that it had been torn open on the side. There was a filthy pillow and some scattered clothes inside, but it was still firmly stalked down. It looked like it had been there a while. The final one was back in Texas, out near Enchanted Rock, walking around the woods with some friends when they stumbled into a pit full of rattlesnakes. I don't know if you've ever seen a snake den, but they tend to ball up into a horrifying Lovecraftian nightmare. I am from Alaska. I was born into the Togatelli tribe in the center of Alaska in 1980. This is about 50 miles south of Fairbanks in a small town called Nenana. There are several other tribes in the immediate area and long ago there were far more before Russian and American settlement. I don't want to identify myself on accident in case anyone from here ends up hearing this, but suffice to say that paranormal experiences are natural and expected as part of my ancestral heritage. As a child, my grandparents told my father strange stories of the stick men who were eaters of men. They especially loved the flesh of children and newborn babies were considered delicacies by these spirits of the forest. One time when Nanana was first being settled by Gusok, white people, there was a hunter who came from faraway lands to settle the wilderness of Alaska and hunt its bears and moose. He took a small party of hunters and native guides into the forest, deep into the countryside to the marshes, where moose and bear frequented. Far down the Titana they went, shooting every animal they saw, squirrel, moose, wolf, porcupine. The natives were silent and led the men on, afraid to question their violent, wasteful ways. Until late one evening, the hunter called his party to set up camp and rest. They chose a quiet spot in a field, where they could see all around them in case wolves decided to try and sneak up, and they rolled out their blankets after dinner and went to sleep, leaving some to take turns watching for animals. The hunter had fallen asleep quickly, content on his bed of furs and blankets. He had dreams of sunny days, perfect for hunting the famed grizzly. He was awoken by the sound of cracking sticks. He found this odd, as they were in a field, but perhaps it was the men rekindling the fire. He peeked out of his tent to check on the encampment. Horror of horrors. There were pools of blood on the ground, but no corpses. He watched as a man bundled tightly in his blankets was lifted up by what appeared to be many small moving sticks and carried off towards the edge of the camp. The man woke up from the gentle rocking of his convoy and screamed 
alerting the remaining hunters in the camp, who jumped up and reached for their guns. They were quick to draw but were confused by what to fire at, as mostly they just saw sticks on the ground moving in ways that were impossible. They decided to run, because there was nothing clear to shoot at. But as they ran together, they were chased by giant animals that appeared suddenly from the tall grass. The hunter waited, until the men were being chased by all the animals, then jumped from his tent, and without looking back when he heard their screams, ran as fast as he could. A week later, he showed up in Nanana, crazed, exhausted, and on the edge of death. He related his story and then perished, for he would constantly wake up screaming if he tried to sleep, and thus could not rest. A version of this story is common in my family, though some details change with the storyteller. My father has seen the stick men on a hunting trip, and like this apocryphal hunter, he has been crazed and terrorized by the memory ever since. It is said that though the stick men go by different names and come to people in different shapes, that there is some regularity to their appearance. They generally come as either sticks, which blend in with trees, or the ground, until you come upon them, or they can visit you as an animal. This animal is usually described as either a large deer or a small moose, which can move incredibly quick for how awkward it seems to be hunched on its legs. They appear as pale or white animals, and though they usually do this to intimidate men and women, they are hungry beings who feast on the unwary. Seeing a stick man, one may be haunted for years or their entire life afterwards, but in some cases it is considered good luck, as if a stick man is uninterested with you. It means that you have powerful ancestors surrounding you. You can usually anticipate the arrival of a stick man, as the entire forest will go quiet around you for as long as they are in the vicinity, and sometimes they will speak to you and to each other. When this happens, they sound like a raspy whisper, mixed with the rattling of dry willow branches, a light chattering. Do not camp where the forest is silent, and do not look into the eyes of the stick men, for they will drive you mad with fear. I have never seen these spirits personally at least, I can't be sure. My only experience with one potentially happened outside of Carson City, Nevada. I was driving alone in a big Ford pickup truck late at night when I noticed what originally I took to be a deer on the side of the road. This was no deer. It ran like a dog or cat, staying close to the ground in a liquid motion, whereas a deer would bounce or gallop as they ran. It also moved upwards of 30 miles an hour, and when it turned and ran down the hill, I realized it was much larger than almost any deer I'd ever seen, yet lacked antlers. Please, ask your questions if you have, and feel free to share your own experiences below. I am an 18 year old male, from Namibia, Africa. I experienced this in 2016, along with my older sister and girlfriend. It happened during the school holidays, as we took a trip to my grandparents farm. It was one of the places that we loved going to. One morning after having breakfast, my father informed my sister and I to go make a stop at another farmer's farm. He told us that we were to deliver a few farm tools to him that my granddad had supposedly borrowed. My sister perked up when she heard that we would take the car since the farm was a few kilometers away. My sister and I decided to let my girlfriend tag along, since she still didn't know my family very well. As we were driving along the gravel road, we joked, talked about small things and other crazy stuff, until we reached a road that had trees on either side of it. The trees grew in such a way, that they blocked the sun's rays from reaching the gravel road. So, we were basically driving under a large shade. I want to let all of you know that I'm very familiar with this part of the road, 
and I've driven through it many times before, and nothing strange has ever happened. But on this peculiar day, something was off. The birds that usually sang were quiet. Even the wind seemed to be silenced as we drove. By now, we were all quiet, and just listening to the gravel beneath the tires of the car. We passed a large tree that had a white mark on its bark, and I dismissed it as I have seen it many times before, and after a few moments I realised that something wasn't right. I checked the time on the radio and it read 2.07. My eyes immediately went wide. We left our farm at 12.30. It never took us long to reach our neighbour. I was a little confused by this. Then my girlfriend said something from the back seat that confused me even more. Guys, didn't we pass this tree five minutes ago? I looked up, just in time to see us passing the same large tree with the same white mark on its bark. I knew something wasn't right, and I immediately looked at my sister and she had a frown on her face that I couldn't exactly interpret. What the hell? I said out loud. We drove a little more, and we passed the same tree every time, until my sister got angry, and we came to a stop just a few feet away from the same tree. We got out, and were met with a deafening silence. My girlfriend got spooked, got closer to me, and I put an arm around her. Okay, what the hell is going on around here? My sister said. I don't know. We should have been at the guy's farm by now. We drove past this tree 20 times, my girlfriend said. I'm no stranger to the paranormal. I've had weird experiences before, but nothing ever like this. I was incredibly freaked out, to say the least. As we got into the car again, we saw a red pickup truck drive slowly past us. My sister immediately started the car and closely followed the pickup truck. We drove through the wooded area just a few feet behind it, and after moments, we realised that the environment started to change. I sighed in relief, as I saw the dam that was on the right side of the road. We were all glad we got out of there safely. I don't know if this was a loop or a glitch, but it was definitely paranormal. I know this sounds unbelievable, but I know what I experienced that day. We all did. We got home safely without any incident, but we never told our family or anyone else what happened. We have all heard stories of the area of the road being haunted, but I never believed them. After experiencing this, however, I can safely say, that my point of view on the matter has changed. When I travelled to India about 20 years ago, I took the bus to travel from one city to another. It was a night bus, so most of the people around me were sleeping. It was dark, and the roads were surrounded by forest out in the middle of nowhere. The road was only illuminated by the headlights of the bus, and we were seemingly alone on the road. I was bored, and passed the time by staring out the window. There I saw a creature on the side of the road, hurrying into the dark woods. The moment lasted no more than a second or two, but I saw the creature clearly. It looked like something with a human body doing an inverted crab walk. It had the head of a Doberman dog or jackal, and had a waddling gait with each limb moving independently like an insect. Everyone around me was asleep, and I felt like I had gone insane. I kept telling myself, I must have caught a glimpse of something else and misinterpreted it in my mind. Because I caught a glimpse of it, and later years, I questioned whether I was dreaming it. I feel extremely certain of what I saw, but I'm probably wrong. There is probably a logical explanation to it. I'm a very rational person, and do not believe in supernatural things, but being in an Indian forest at night will make even the most sane person doubt their mind. Those forests 
are truly scary places. I live in rural Australia. One early summer afternoon, I was bushwalking down a big ass hill, which has a river down at the bottom. From the peak of the hill to the base, is about 500 meters. However, the track sort of snakes in back and forth like an S shape, as it's too steep of a hill to just go straight down. About a third of the way down, I spotted a pair of feet from about the ankles down sticking out between some bushes, with the feet running perpendicular to the track. As I got closer, I could see that a man was lying down there, and based on his body position assumed he was resting, and likely homeless and or disoriented, seeking shade from the summer sun, further adding to my theory that he was homeless. He had long hair, a long head, and was wearing track pants, and it was 35 degrees Celsius at least. I got about 100 meters from where I saw the man, and was now on a section of the track, running parallel and below to where he was, now walking in the opposite direction. I had followed a curve on the track S. I saw that this man was suddenly running down, Seeing this unnerved me, as based on his outfit, he did not appear to be a local jogger. As fight or flight began to kick in, I pulled out my inhaler, took a puff, and pretended that I was about to start jogging. I wanted to commit to my act, in case I had judged him wrongly, and he was really a local jogger, albeit a poorly dressed one. He continued to run after me along the track, and I was about two thirds of the way down, when I noticed he was running too hard to merely be a jogger. He was running closer to a sprinting pace than a jog, which as most people know is a terrible idea when running downhill, let alone in 35 plus degree heat, in track pants, and with no visible water bottle. As he gained ground on me, I decided to sit on my ass and slide down the hill between sections of the track that ran parallel to one another. Once I finally made it to the bottom and across to the other side of the river, I turned and saw he had stopped running. I continued to walk along the river, when after about five steps I heard him yell out something obscene. I continued to run on and off until I made my way back to the nearest road, and am yet to return to that track. Years ago, when I was still a teenager, my friend Justin and I would often go longboarding at night, as my friend and I were quite the night owls. We loved the freedom of almost never seeing another soul on the roads or the paths we frequented. Even when using main roads, it would be very rare to see a car out so late in such a rural area and you could see and hear them coming from very far away due to their headlights, and the noise of the vehicle disrupting the peaceful silence of the night. We were really into it at the time, and would often ride our boards for miles and miles, sometimes not arriving home until the sun was up. One particular night, we decided to ride a few miles away from our usual back roads, to take one of our favourite hidden routes. It began with a narrow paved path, that was the only piece of land separating two sides of a long lake. It would often sink under, due to rain, and we wanted to seize the opportunity to use it before it rained and went underwater again. It was roughly two miles long, and extremely relaxing to ride through due to the scenery. After making it to the end of the lake, we decided to continue moving, and turn into a very close path that leads directly into a densely wooded wilderness preservation. As we came up to the first hill, we looked down at the bottom into the blackness. We both noticed what appeared to be a tiny moving ball of dim light down there. It moved so strangely, and it was extremely difficult to make out what it was. 
rather than shine our flashlight down. We curiously watched it for a few moments, whispering to each other about what it could possibly be. All at once, that small light turned into multiple blinding lights and extremely loud revving sounds, overwhelming our senses that had become accustomed to the dark and silence. Acting purely on fear, we instantly turned around and ran as fast as we could, hearing yelling and revving gaining behind us. By sheer luck, we managed to run off the path into a very dark, very overgrown hole in the side of a hill, overlooking where we had just come from. We decided to hide in the natural dugout of this hill, hoping the plants and darkness would be enough to protect us from whatever was happening out there. We watched our pursuers ride up to where we had originally been standing. There were four men, two on four wheelers and two on fully sized motorcycles. They were yelling at each other about something, but we couldn't make out what they were saying due to the distance we had covered. We felt safe enough to whisper very softly to each other and speculate who these people could be. Our first thought was they might be park rangers of some kind. Although we had never seen one here in the many times we'd been through, and honestly we doubted that this county had the budget or even the desire to have anyone patrol the deep woods at night. Besides that, these men were on vehicles entirely inappropriate for the paved bike trails. And they were very angry about something. They called out to us for a while yelling things like, We know you're out there. We can see you. Come out. We stayed silent and decided to call their bluff instead of running. Eventually, we clearly heard one of the men yell, Find them now and smash a bottle. That had erased any hopes we had that these were just park rangers. We watched them split up, each of them going a different way down the series of paths on their vehicles, including the path we came from. It took us what felt like ages to even move. We were frozen in terror inside that dugout watching the lights from the vehicles travel through the woods and paths. One of them already coming full circle and passing the point he started from. I thought about calling for help, but was too afraid to open my phone in fear that even the smallest amount of light would give away our location. After waiting for the lights of the vehicles to reach their furthest distance yet, we finally summoned the nerve to get up and try to run somewhere far enough from these people to safely make a call. We ran as hard and fast as we could through the woods. Since their headlights gave away their location on these paths, we could hide again whenever we felt that they were getting too close. Our available hiding spots were getting progressively worse as the woods became less dense and the fear I felt waiting for one of them to drive past us while basically only being covered in leaves and plants may still be unmatched to this day. Finally, we emerged from the woods onto the intersection of two main roads, far from where we had started. We ducked down into the ditch to call for help. When I opened my phone, I noticed I had recent missed calls from one of our other friends, Connor, who was supposed to meet up with us after our longboard excursion. I called him and frantically asked where he was. Luck was with us again. He hadn't given up on our plans despite us ignoring him, and was only a few miles away, already heading in our direction. I gave him the names of the two streets we were near the corner of, and explained that we needed to be picked up right away. He agreed and sped over to us while Justin and I waited in hiding. Thankfully, Connor arrived before any of those men did. We bolted into the back seats of his car, yelling for him to get the hell out of there, and he took off. Relief doesn't begin to describe what I felt being safely driven home after everything I had experienced. 
after explaining everything that happened to Connor. We ended up just moving on with our night and decided not to call the police. We figured they would be gone by the time any officer made it out there, and that we would only be putting ourselves at risk by admitting to breaking the law and taking those paths so late at night. I still have no idea what happened or who those people were. I've been told all kinds of theories from friends and family that have heard this story. Some think we walked right up to a huge drug deal. Justin and I later admitted to each other that when the revving started and we couldn't see it, our minds both went straight to chainsaw wielding horror movie serial killer. So I suppose it could have been much worse. Frustratingly enough, whatever those men thought we saw that made them want to catch us so badly, we never actually saw. We'll never really know, I suppose. When I was 13, my mum decided I would be going to military boarding school. It was located north of Mexico in a place called Durango. Durango is known because it is home to many creepy things, drug cartels, the zone of silence, ghost towns, UFO sightings and the like. I was in that school for around six years. And one day a friend invited me and other students to go to his hometown to have some tacos with his dad, a well known rancher. When we arrived to the town, we were on his house having some drinks and eventually he decided it was time to go. We hopped into his pickup truck and he began driving right when the sun was setting. After about half an hour, everything was dark and he had to turn on the headlights. I was on the front seat with my friend and we've just arrived to the place. He slowed down his car and we could hear the nocturnal wildlife and some scratches on the car from branches and plants. The headlights allowed us to see just enough to distinguish shapes. He stopped the car right in front of a little lake and we could see some bushes and trees around the water. A few meters in front of the right headlight, we could see what we thought was a rock. The guys started unloading the truck while they joked around. My friend and I were still in the front smoking when all of a sudden he said, did you see that? While he pointed to the rock in front of the car with the tip of the cigarette. That just moved. Since I've always wanted to see something paranormal, I remained still. We were both looking at this rock when all of a sudden, the thing turned its head to face us with, I thought, what looked like the face of Gollum. Big round yellow eyes and arched back. And I turned to my friend, he grabbed his gun and quickly got out of the car and fired two shots into the sky. All of this while people are still unloading the truck and making a fire for the grill and such. I heard a few scream. I saw how this creature looked up to the sky, turned around and hopped into the water. Right after that, everyone began asking, what happened? My friend told us that it was actually a common sight. He explained that his father and grandfather often saw the creature when they were hunting. He said that they called it Hombre Rana or Frogman. Just a few of the guys saw the thing. We still had the tacos and everything. We were a little creeped out, but we assumed that the Frogman was probably more scared of us than we were of him. I saw many terrifying, creepy and odd things in Durango, but the frogman takes the cake. I have been mountain biking since I was 11. It was the only thing that I thought would make me stand out from the crowd, and I was hooked. I moved to a smaller city when I was 15, which was surrounded by mountains and countless wild trails to explore. So I was thrilled when I finally found a riding buddy willing to take the risks. We went out riding all the time. He was born there so he knew a lot of trails and was very familiar with the suburbs. 
We lived in a very religious community. Traditions oblige that in a certain month, we have to abstain from eating and drinking anything from sunrise to sunset. Our cycling hobby was no excuse to this tradition. During this month, we limited ourselves to a 30 km ride every two days, in order not to cause ourselves physical harm or injury. As we were approaching the city limits returning from a ride, my friend urged me to check out this new trail he had discovered. And despite the exhaustion and dehydration, I obliged. We took a right turn into some woods. The trail was amazing. Smooth dirt path, beautiful scenery and occasional jumps. We were absolutely carried away until the trail disappeared into fresh agricultural soil that was impossible to ride on. We hopped off the bikes to go back to our trail on foot. And as we walked back, I started to think this was a bad idea. Maybe we shouldn't have gone too deep into the woods. We were in full mountain bike gear, flashy stuff and easily noticeable from a distance. My friend was very calm though. We found our trail and the second I lifted my leg to hop on my bike, some dude grabs my shoulder. Three guys with dirty clothes, scarred faces and reeked of BO and cow shit. What are you doing here? The older guy starts. I was too scared to speak. And my friend handles these kind of situations better. So he did the talking. They started asking us all kind of questions about our bikes and gear. Till one of them laid a hand on my friend's bike and dragging it from him. I remember his exact words. I'm sorry, but we're taking the bikes. Before we protested, he adds, are you fasting today or not? I answered that we were, well, we're not. And if you weren't fasting, we would have taken the bikes and slashed you guys up before sunset. They said it in such a cool and strange tone and topped it off with stay safe out there. I was in awe. My friend told me he was about to pull out his knife when the guy grabbed his bike. I can only imagine what would have happened. I moved out of that city, picked up motorcycles, and we still ride together and joke about the encounter. I'm grateful it only turned out as badly as it did. I was visiting family in the US when I was a kid. We were on a three hour drive in the middle of nowhere in Pennsylvania. I had to take a leak really bad. And my dad eventually pulls the car over so that I could go in the woods. This was about at 11 o'clock in the morning. I went far off to the road into the woods because I didn't want anyone to see me. I wound up being completely out of sight of my family and the road itself. I started urinating next to this large rock and notice up ahead that there were these three figures digging around in the dirt. At first I was like, damn, these people will see me. So I continued to finish without urinating. And as I kept my eye on them, I noticed that they definitely weren't human. They seemed to be in suits. However, they also looked naked. You could see they had genitals swinging between their legs. At this point, I ran and quietly slipped away from the rock and back to the road in my family's car. A few years later, I was watching Unsolved Mysteries. And there was an episode that had the classic gray type alien. And it looked exactly like the thing that I saw in the woods. I distance hike when I can. Sometimes this means getting up early or staying out late to get as many miles in as possible. Sometimes walking in the pitch dark with a low light headlamp gets spooky. I grew up in the woods of this area. I've slept under our canopy of stars more nights than I can count. I've trekked thousands of miles of trail, riverbanks, lake shores, ridges, bottoms, bogs and creeks. I've hunted the game and I'm establishing this because it's important you understand I've heard, seen and smelt about all this region has to offer in way of wilderness. 
My scariest experience, though, happened at about 4.30 in the morning. It was late spring, so the first morning light wouldn't be visible in the treetops for another 30 to 45 minutes. Another hour passed, that until sunrise. I was on mile five. I'm in a low bottom that's wedged between two steep ridges. The trail I'm on was narrow, muddy, and completely hemmed in thick underbrush. Young maple, an old oak growth. I'm focused on the small light from my headlamp, just one step after the other, zoned out. And that's when I heard a loud crack, and froze solid. This is the part I have trouble describing. 4.30 in springtime means I'm the only thing making noise. No birds chirping, nothing. Dead quiet. Mid-step, I froze. When fight or flight kicks in, you have these immediate instincts, though. The thought that something flashed in my mind as I stood there balancing myself into silence was, if I hear it again, I'm turning around and going back the way I came in a hurry. Why? Because that sound was not just a branch breaking. It wasn't deadfall. It wasn't a widow maker. I was damn sure I had just heard something intentional. Hearing it twice, well, that meant I had to get the hell out of there. To describe it as best I can, it sounded like a decently sized wooden stick be violently shaken and whacked against a smallish tree. More a fungo bat-sized stick than a baseball bat. The distinction in my head being that this sound was a crack and not a thud or thump. And I have described it as explosive in the past as it was so sudden and terribly loud. I had the sense that it was about 50 yards directly in front of me, and it was loud and clear. Now as I stood there completely spooked, I realized the soon to be worse part of my situation. I knew where the sound came from, and I knew where the trail went, in about 30 yards. I was going to come to an 180 degree turn and start up the ridge, going away from the creek. This meant, as soon as I got the courage to move towards the noise, I was going to have to turn back to it and get up that ridge and this made me very nervous. My head somewhere between meth fiend murderer and Bigfoot bludgeoning. Minutes pass. I just breathe my foggy breath into my glasses and listen. Nothing. Dead quiet. I've got about 20 to 30 minutes until first light. I crank up the headlamp and start to slowly creep to the 180 turn. When you wear a headlamp in the woods at night, Every tree branch in front of you casts big black moving shadows on the trail, and that didn't help. I get to the turn and quickly make the bend. I'm moving pretty fast at this point, trying to be quiet, taking tiny shallow breaths so I can listen while going up the trail. And then I smell it. A stench hits me that I can't describe. I just imagined wet, rotten death I've actually worked scenes where humans have expired, in a past life as a firefighter. This was like days old decomposition, but it just smelled strange. I kept walking fast, and by the time I made the top of that ridge, I was huffing, and first light was showing. I didn't stop moving until full light was out, and the birds were chirping. I've heard it all in our woods, I've smelt it all, and I'm telling you, I don't know what the hell that was. Deadfall and especially leafed out branches make a lot of noise on the way down. I've heard it many times, but I just don't know what the hell that was. I live in Russia, and my encounter happened around a year ago in February. I was walking by the embankment at 10 p.m. It was already dark, and nobody was around. There is a road which has three levels, a big street. Then it goes down into a smaller one, and finally the embankment, which turns into a small path through thick snow. Just imagine, 
You're walking through an industrial area which barely has streetlights, no people, and on your left there is a little forest, and on the right there is a river. So I was walking on the path when I saw this man. His whole appearance alarmed me instantly. He had skis on, but was trying to walk as he was without them. In the deep snow, it was around his knee level, and I saw how much effort it took for him not to fall and carry on moving. There was no way to avoid this person, because it was a tiny path through the snow. He was staring at me, smiling. I'm unsure if it was in a predatory way, but something was strange in the smile. I thought, well, if anything happens, I can push him and run, and carry on moving. When I was right next to him, this happened. Everything took place in about three seconds. I was watching his every move with my side vision, and in one moment, he vanished. There was nowhere to hide. The trees give you at least a hundred meters worth of visibility, and hiding in the snow isn't an option. You would be visible regardless. He was gone. I slightly turned my head to that direction when I captured something right behind me. A stick man. It was absolutely black, around my height, maybe a bit taller, very thin, with a big head and no neck at all. It was standing in a very threatening position, with its arms set apart like an animal preparing to attack. This figure looked like a picture printed straight onto the air. I thought the 2D object should be material at some point, with the thickness of a sheet of paper for example, but no. This looked entirely different. I turned my head away and started running to the second level of the road. When I got there, I looked back. This thing was peeking out of a tree, and when I spotted it, it hid behind it. At this point I really thought that I was going to die for sure, and when I got to the third level some cars were driving by, so it calmed me down a little. I looked back. The stick man was standing in the spot where I was a second ago, right in the middle of the road. The whole landscape looked so unreal that at some point I questioned my sanity. This time, I kept the contact and tried to examine the thing. The stick man was slightly moving back and forth, but its whole body had a very stable dark black figure. I got a feeling. The feeling saying that I shouldn't be seeing this, that my survival instincts were blurring out of my mind, that were telling me to flee. And it was also a feeling like, he's found me. Imagine the feeling when you play hide and seek, and your cousin is very slow finding anyone, so you sit somewhere for 20 minutes. At first you feel the pleasure from the game, but then as time drags on you get bored. And when they finally find you, it's almost like a relief. I think that something tried to stop me from walking away, because at some point there was a little desire to approach it. Anyway, it was obvious that it was following me, and the thing is I lived very close to that area. I didn't know what to do, either to wander through the streets so it would lose me, or go directly home, but this thing would know where I lived. I decided to run to safety immediately without looking back, and yes, that wasn't the end. That night, I had sleep paralysis. I remember laying in bed listening to the sound of water from my aquarium, when it suddenly stopped. I thought someone was trying to grab my attention, so I opened my eyes, and right next to the bed was the same black figure. This was it. The end of my life. I literally saw my entire existence flash before my eyes. It stood three feet away from me, and then it turned in a fog, and started to fill my lungs through my nose and throat. When it was entirely inside my body, I awoke, or I didn't sleep at all, I don't know. The thing is, I haven't noticed any difference with myself since. This whole encounter was very different from anything I've seen in my life. 
There are things you've never experienced before, so you don't actually know what to think or feel, and are filled with curiosity. I am low-key disturbed. Would I one day find myself in the middle of nowhere approaching a random person with the skis on, and disappearing next moment? Did that dream mean anything, or was it a dream? I barely remember that man's face. This has been a terribly odd and confusing experience. And if anyone has encountered anything similar, I'd love to hear about it. So that I know I'm not the only one. This story happened to my sister-in-law four years ago. They are uber religious, and the state of her mental stability, on top of a finger found and a police follow-up, makes this story 100% true and searchable. Last July, my sister-in-law Jackie was going back to Boise to visit for the weekend. Her husband lives in Provo and is going to law school there, as he's just graduated from a BYU chapter somewhere in southern Idaho. I'm not from Idaho, and I'm not Mormon so I don't remember where it's located. Anyway, Jackie decided to drive from Provo, Utah, and head up to BYU to say hello to her friends just before coming back to Boise. The route she was on was I-15, which forks off into I-84 up to Boise. After you pass through Salt Lake City, the route becomes lost in a plain rolling flat of miscellaneous desert dotted by farmland here and there. Jackie left Provo, Utah in the evening, as she planned on making dinner for her husband before her departure. She ended up leaving around 11pm, and given the late time, she decided to forego visiting her friends at the BYU chapter, and headed along I-84 to come straight to Boise. She was in between Tremonton, Utah, and Burley, Idaho, in the literal middle of nowhere, where she drove up to what looked like a body lying in the road. The location is so desolate, there are no radio channels, cell phone services, or lights to be seen for hours. This 24-year-old girl was in the middle of the desert, in a green Dodge car that already had enough problems, so it's a miracle she made it home to us without issue to begin with. She arrived at my wife's parents' house, but that was just the beginning of the story, really. Here is her account of what led to these events. At 2am, she said she saw something lying on the road in the distance. As she approached it, she could see it was a body, lifeless, in the middle of nowhere. It stretched across both lanes, and she could not simply pass without running it over. Cautiously, she came to a stop, and made sure she parked about 15 yards away, and stopped. She opened the door and yelled, Are you alright? But no response could be heard. With the car lights broadcasting brightly on the body in the road, she got out of her car and slowly walked towards the person. As she got about 10 feet from the body in the road, she could see it was a dummy, fully dressed in human clothes just lying there. Terrified, she sprinted back to her car, slammed on the door, and sped over the dummy. We received the cell phone call from her around Mountain Home, 45 minutes away from Boise. She was shaken and terribly scared, claiming she could hear footsteps chasing her to her car before she got in and drove off. We wrote it off as a freak accident, as we were all asleep and sounded too bizarre to worry of anything. As she pulled into the subdivision, she called us once again to help her unload the car, and probably console given the bizarre experience. I opened the garage door, and stood in the driveway with my wife, waiting for her to pull in. She came racing into the driveway, and jumped out of the car, and this is where I lost it. As she opened the car door, a finger fell out. 
She had not stopped and drove straight to us after she came across the dummy. The person who had placed the dummy had chased her back to her car. And as she slammed the door and sped off, the person had reached out, losing a finger in the slammed door. We immediately called the police in the area where she said she stopped at. The cops did a survey of all the hospitals in the area for a man missing a finger, and they found an exact match of his description. He was still in the hospital as he was arrested. The police did not give any details into the man's past or who he was, just simply told us to not worry about him, as he'd been arrested. I'm sure it's an anticlimactic ending to a terrifying scenario. But I will never forget the feeling that came over me when the finger fell out of her car door. I always drive with a firearm in my vehicle now. Any time I need to travel. I went on a midnight walk with my girlfriend. The park by her house has a dirt trail that led up a small mountain. It was about a 30 minute walk to the top. But the view overlooking the city was gorgeous. At the top, the dirt path became paved concrete with a small sitting area. We stayed at the top for about 30 minutes. Upon leaving is where things got creepy. As we started to head back down at the point where the concrete met dirt path, there was a large pile of trash bags in a crescent shape in the corner of the paths intersection. It was not there when we first arrived. The pile was much too large and in the way for someone who likes to cut corners of paths to notice. My girlfriend remarked at how the shape resembled a dead body and asked me if I had noticed it on the way up. I was very sure that it was not there 30 minutes prior when we arrived. I was extremely sure. Nonetheless, there was no reason to freak my anxiety prone girlfriend out. So I laughed and said, Yeah, must have been there and it was probably trash. Visibility was extremely low, probably about five yards. And I didn't want to freak her out. But I was pretty tilted. And I got heckled for being drunk and not listening to her. But in actuality, I was looking and listening for any signs of people around us. In my own head, I was telling myself that I'm just being paranoid and that it was probably there and I didn't notice it to begin with. But at the same time, I was also sure that it wasn't. I'm sorry I didn't have time to listen to your story about Jesse from work. I'm worried about our safety at the moment. We made it back to our car without running into anyone. But I kind of laughed at myself for being worried about nothing and also felt the relaxation of my butt muscles that had been clenched for the last half hour. A few days later, the local news covered a dead body found near a park in Anthem at the top of the mountains. Guys, it was actually a dead body. Literally getting chills just saying that. It was actually someone dead. Thank God that my girlfriend didn't watch the news or she'd have probably shat herself. I've had a lot of strange jobs, but one of the most interesting was working for a tax company based out of Texas. I lived in Kentucky, my home state at the time. But because this company contracted out jobs remotely, I was able to make a very good living for performing tasks which were generally very simple. I had a work partner and our duty was to travel all over the eastern and central part of the state to county courthouse PVA offices. You might not have those. It's a small town thing and research delinquent property taxes. We were then required to compile a list of properties who had delinquent taxes and submit it to our boss. She was our primary contact in Texas. This part is important because it was the only reason we would sometimes have to deal with hostile people. The company would then buy the taxes if the property tickled their fancy and a letter was issued to the owner of the property stating they had a certain amount of time to repay the amount. 
I'm not sure what would happen after that, since that isn't part of my job. But I do know that people immediately assumed, because of lack or knowledge or understanding of the law, this company was going to take their property and throw them out on the street. Before the company bought the taxes, however, they would send us back a list of the ones they were interested in. And we would then go out to the location, photograph the property, and then submit all the photos to our Texas contact. This is where things got interesting. It was like the property owners had some kind of psychic intuition about us. They had no idea who we were, or when we were coming since we worked almost always on our own. And they didn't know what kind of color car we would be in. Yet somehow they would frequently burst out their front doors as we pulled up to take pictures of their location. This made for some interesting and often frightening confrontations. After getting comfortable with the job, I even came up with a convincing story to tell angry property owners when they chased us down with their car. We're from the Country Property Valuation Administration. We're just updating our property files and need a current photo. This would de-escalate the situation, and they'd apologize for threatening our lives and sometimes running us off the road to make us pull over. I had a lot of stories from this job, but here's the best one. We were deep in the hills of Eastern Kentucky one day, searching desperately for a single wide trailer from our list. We found a holler matching our direction. This is way before the GPS days, and we had to use real country maps and took a chance. As we drove up the holler, houses began to spread out further and further, and soon we were totally isolated, nothing but trees and a narrow gravel road. Suddenly we spotted the trailer. It didn't look anything like it did in the PVA picture. Time had really taken a toll on this place. Some of you might not understand this, depending on where you're from, but around my home state, one grows very accustomed to the look and feel of a potential location for drug manufacturing. I know that might not make sense, but trust me, we knew immediately that this place was a prime location for a meth lab. We didn't spot the trailer until we had driven a little ways past it, so we didn't get a great photo on the way in. As usual, we decided to drive on by, turn around, and get the shot on the way back. Apparently, someone saw us on the way in. This was a very rural road, and not even a road at this point, since it had turned to gravel a mile or two back. I basically had to turn the car by pulling up onto an embankment and doing what felt like a 32 point turn to keep from going off into a ditch. While I was turning, my buddy said, Hey, look. I looked, and three people were walking out of the woods into the road. Just people, no big deal. I had the car straightened out on the road at this point, and noticed they had weapons. A young, nasty-looking fellow was holding a baseball bat of all things. A nasty-looking older fellow had a shovel. Both were shirtless, and then there was a screaming girl. Something clicked in my head. On the drive-in when my partner snapped the photo, I heard a girl scream. It was an angry scream, but I couldn't make out what she said. I didn't even know where it came from, and I certainly didn't think the scream was directed at us. Apparently it was. These people were now walking with intention towards my car. I kept thinking, is this really happening? And what exactly is happening? My partner was freaking out a little, and convinced they were going to attack us. It's hard to explain what was going on through my head at this point, because I couldn't really believe what I was seeing. The only thing I could think of was, hit them with the car, just like on Grand Theft Auto, otherwise you're gonna die. They were screaming, shaking their weapons and closing in, and I was running out of time. I revved the tiny engine in my red Pontiac Grand Prix, hoping to scare them, and then I let off the gas. I plowed towards them with the fury of all six cylinders, or four, however many there were, 
and they jumped out of the way at the last minute, as I grazed by them, throwing gravel and dirt into the air. Once we were at a safe distance, I slowed down and looked back. Luckily, they were gone. Unluckily, we were once again too far from the trailer to get a good shot. I explained this to my boss when I emailed her my day's recollection of property photos, and she seemed to understand. After that, I kept a loaded .45 in my glove box and felt significantly more confident while doing my job. I quit a couple of years later though. It was just too dangerous, even if I was packing heat. So to the hillbilly meth-making counterparts of Otis, Baby, and Captain Spaulding, let's not meet again. In college, I lived up on top of a mountain road, but still only five minutes to tow down a trail through the woods. There was a hundred plus year old oak in the yard, slab stone porch built by hand. I lived in the studio apartment that was outside the main house. The main house was haunted, but my shack was cozy. The woods up there were weird too. I've never really been in the main house, after all, but the three who lived there said some nights you couldn't sleep from all the noise, the floorboards creaking, the thumps and knocks. My experiences happened outside. Like I said, I hunted small game up there, as there must have been a rabbit colony in the vicinity, plus a few squirrel drays. Often out there while I was stalking, I'd get the distinct feeling of being stalked myself. Keep in mind, this stand of forest is only several acres, but it was preserved mainly because of the historic oak trees scattered about. It's old woods. I would hear laughter, like children's laughter, but not quite like in a creepy movie. It was a bit distorted, and almost like flirty giggles that you might imagine a fairy make. It would come from a different location each time I sought it, and I eventually decided to stop following it and hunt. It never did stop. I would sometimes spend an afternoon in town having drinks or hanging at my friend's place. I'd finally leave and have enough liquid courage to hike back up the trail in the dark. That laughter would be replaced by noise, just like things running all around you and dashing about the trees. I've been an outdoorsman for a long time, and I know the woods are noisy at night, particularly in the Southern Appalachians. But this was different. It was dead silent out there in that stand at night, except for this rushing to and from by some unseen feet. Not like game fleeing, deer run away and crash about doing it. These steps were like something or things running swiftly around me. It's like it would cross the trail ahead and then behind me, and then alongside me, but I would never see it. I was a big time night owl back then, and was regularly up doing schoolwork into 3 or 4 a.m. One such night, it had just snowed a fresh 20 inches or so, decent accumulation for the area. Our yard and the woods were like a paradise for me and my dog. I was excited to hunt around the next day for tracks, and see if I could locate the rabbit den precisely. I was up working and the dog came scratching to get me, not frantic or anything. I let her in and she lay down to sleep. Odd because she's a husky and preferred the snow to my tiny heated apartment every time. I decided to call a night too and went out for a cigarette. It was 3.24 am. I can still see it on the top of my MacBook display before I closed it. I went out, noted the clouds were dispersed a bit more, and the moon was bright on the snow. I lit my cigarette, and was just looking out across the fence and into the woods, when something caught my eye. It looked like a silhouette of someone leaning against one of those big oak trees, like you'd see someone with a palm planted against the wall, with one arm straight out leaning against it. It's not moving, so I can't tell if I'm just tired, or if the lighting is funny or what. So I walked further to the end of the porch, 
and as soon as I stepped onto the fresh snow, there it took off. The thing was tall. My estimates based on the tree put the thing at seven feet tall. It ran along the border of the fence and back off into the woods. It was hairless as far as I could tell and completely naked. Otherwise, though, its form was just that of a skinny tall man. I went inside and switched to boots, grabbed my rifle and my flashlight, and I went to check the tracks. I picked up a set of what had to be at least a size 14 or 15 bare foot. It ran along the fence and down the treeless stretch of backyard, as if heading into the woods. But then the tracks ended about 20 inches short of the wood line. I don't know if they managed to jump to the tree line. Probably because there weren't any more tracks that I could find that night or the next day. It's like it just completely vanished after that. This was in late November of 2012. And I was doing an install in a winery in North Carolina. It was a long day because we were working out of town. So we worked late to get it finished in one day. I started driving home around midnight and had about a three hour drive back home to Oakland. It's 1.30 in the morning. I'm outside of Stockton and I see this girl standing on the side of the road in the middle of nowhere. She's wearing a little white dress that ends about three inches above her knees and is barefoot. She has long black hair flowing down her shoulders and she is just standing still as a statue. I looked at her as I drove by, but she didn't move. Didn't acknowledge my loud truck as it passed or anything. I was pretty freaked out because you always hear stories like this. And then she just appears in your vehicle with you. But that wasn't the case. She just stood there in the night. The thing that was most weird to me was that it was cold that night in the low 40s, as well as drizzling a fair bit. And she was wearing a short dress and had no shoes standing on the asphalt. If this was just some girl who does this for fun to freak people out, I feel like she would have been extremely cold and would have been shivering. But this girl did not move. Now, after I got home, I was thinking about it and I searched ghost girl outside of Stockton and I found a bunch of articles and stories about the East Eight Mile Road ghost girl. And most of the descriptions fit what I saw to a T. I never went back to the area because I moved to another state shortly after. But I want to travel back there to see what I can find one day. Has anyone else seen this girl in that area? Or has anyone else seen a ghost girl in general on the side of a road like this one? Any info would be appreciated. I grew up in upstate New York, not like Rochester, New York, but backwards of the Finger Lakes, New York. I lived in a smaller city, but my best friend and his somewhat well off family lived in a very secluded area a good many miles outside of town. His family owned a huge plot of land and his neighbors had also given his family permission to roam their land, adding up to hundreds of acres. We had been close since elementary school and had an interesting dynamic. He loved coming to my house to be in town around people. And I loved going to his place to escape the woods and enjoy nature. Around the time we turned 14, we started to explore deeper into the forest than before. Somewhat due to our interest in exploration, but mostly due to his family not wanting us to go too deep into the woods for fear of getting lost or running across the bears that live nearby. After a few hikes, maybe a mile or so up the hill, we discovered a vast network of old logging trails and abandoned campsites full of junk. 
Most of the junk that was distinguishable was made of glass, bottles of all sizes and colours, and an assortment of old power insulators from power lines long since decayed. We guessed from 1930s. But what does a 14 year old know about dating such things? One day, about a year later, we decided to explore deeper. An important fact of the situation is his father had spent a great deal of time teaching us firearm safety. This was for many reasons, but a running rule was not to venture into the woods without a firearm to scare off the bears or deal with situations that could arise. This has never been an issue, and certainly felt like a good rule. We packed snacks, water, some super basic camping supplies, and two rifles. We set off to venture as far into the trails as we could, with enough time to return before dark. We started up the trails we were used to, and found an old path that seemed to be a bit more dense in vegetation, and had a small stream running alongside it. We followed it and found four more campsites, with all the same junk piles as the others, except one which has a wooden shed that was mostly collapsed with some cans and rusted tools inside. Nothing very special, but an exciting discovery for a 15 year old kid. We proceeded another mile or so, and we noticed a dark silhouette about a quarter of a mile down the trail. Clearly a large structure, but definitely not a house or shed. As we got closer there, we clearly saw the rectangular wooden structure. It was in good condition despite clearly being very old. A single door on the end of the short side was closed, as were the six windows along the long side leading towards the stream that ran to the right of the trail. There was rotting wood along the stream edge, which we figured was once a water wheel to power whatever this building once did. As we approached the door, we readied the flashlight we had, but something strange happened. It might have been our nerves in the moment of course, but the normal sounds of the wood dimmed. No leaves shaking, no animals scurrying, nothing. Even the stream seemed silent. The sort of silence which makes your skin crawl. The sort of silence where you can seem to hear your own blood flow. We opened the door and turned on the flashlight. It was very dark inside, as the wooden shutters kept the light out quite well. With small slivers of light, peeking between the various boards making up the structure. The room was small, and mostly empty. On the left, a small workbench stood with a rusty saw blade, and some rusted chains on it. Otherwise, only some nails sticking out of the wall broke up the room. We walked towards the door across the room and opened it, with the trail of light from the front door following us, as we had no intention on closing it. We stepped into the next room, and immediately suffered a series of shivers and goosebumps. But neither of us wanted to seem scared to the other, so we continued looking around. We scanned the room, which was a bit more exciting than the last two. Larger windows on each side, and yet another door opposite us, with many more rusted items around. As we looked over the various rusted items, we slowly walked deeper into the room, and we approached the center of the room as it grew darker. Suddenly, the front door shut. We both jumped and looked back, shining the flashlight, but nothing was there, except the door with its faint bands of light shining through its old boards. We caught our breath and decided it must have been the wind, and pressed on. We approached the door, and it was certainly noticeable we both wanted to get out of here, due to the unease of the air inside. We entered the last room, and it was the same as the first, except there was a larger table instead of a bench along the wall. Nothing sat on it, but a hammer lied on the floor at its base. The hammer seemed newer than the previous items, but we would not have time to inspect it, 
as we jumped in terror when the first door to the prior room slammed shut. This was clearly not the wind, and both of us immediately panicked. We drew our rifles and yelled as we slowly backed towards the door in the room we had not opened yet. We noticed the light through its boards as we entered the room, so we assumed it was the exit, and now it was the only option we felt we had. We yelled again this time, forming words instead of the frightened yell we had before. Is someone there? But nothing. We opened the door behind us, watching into the dark room we had been in previously, and stepped out into the silent woods. We looked around and saw no one, which was almost more unsettling than it would have been had there actually been someone. We started walking down the trail towards his home using the stream as a navigation marker. As we started to lose sight of the structure, we thought we saw something outside the door that we had exited. We were startled, but we were almost certain it wasn't there before. A shadow that resembled the outline of an average height person. We pressed on another half mile or so and started to hear twigs and sticks breaking a good ways behind us. We turned around and looked, but saw no movement. Instead, a shadow almost silhouetting a person stood by a tree about 500 yards from us. Hello? Why are you following us? We're armed. But again, no response. No movement, not a noise, it just existed there next to the tree. We started to run down the trail, and about a mile further along we turned back, and it was there again over some bushes, about the same distance back it stood. We really felt the terror overtake us, and we started yelling. Stop following us. You're trespassing, we have guns. But nothing. It just loomed in the woods, and we couldn't help but feel a piercing stare. We continued to run, and once we neared his house, we turned back again in a fairly large clearing only a mere one third of a mile from his house or so. But again, there it was in the tree line at the end of the clearing. We yelled, go away. You're trespassing, we're gonna fire at you. Childish, but we felt cornered at this point. So my friend fired a warning shot towards it, hoping it would run or at least flinch. Instead, it almost felt like the world stopped for a moment. Everything felt strange in a way I could best compare to the feeling you have after waking up from the strangest falling dream. It did not move. This was such an unexpected reaction that we turned and ran to his house as fast as we could. Once inside, we hid in his basement playing video games and attempting to pretend like none of it had happened. Many years later, we rounded up a group of friends and hopped on an ATV to return to the structure. We rode the entire length of the stream and found many campsites, but never again did we find that building. It simply was not where it should have been. I don't know how to explain this story, but I know it's kept me up many a night. Has anyone else had this sort of thing happen? Or perhaps an explanation? When my sister and I were younger, we used to go to Faxon Park in Quincy and spend hours exploring the woods. Not a lot of woods in a suburban city, so we took advantage of what we had. One day we were pretty deep in there and came upon a clearing. There were a couple of fire rings and three trees had been cut down, stripped and propped together to make a tripod. There was a length of frayed rope hanging from the middle. There were some empty booze bottles and trash strewn about, and a few logs arranged like benches. The whole arrangement reminded us of a courtroom. There was nothing overly creepy about this scene at the moment, but we felt a little uneasy knowing that something had gone to the trouble to set all of this up in the middle of the woods. Cut to a week later, I'm reading the local paper, and the front page has a story about a homeless man that was murdered in Faxon Park. 
Turns out another homeless dude got into an argument with him. A group of them had been drinking in the woods and strung him up by his feet in a makeshift tripod and held their own trial before beating him to death. We had unknowingly stumbled upon the crime scene. To this day, I'm ever so thankful that we didn't find the body. I grew up on a property that connected to a game preserve. So my brothers and I practically ran wild in them constantly. Over the years, there were many times I felt there was something bad in the woods. Not all the time, but more at night. And not even every night. We also had an outhouse. So I'd have to go out in them at night more than your average kid. Flash forward to being 14, 15, and deciding to go get some plants to make a terrarium. We walked back the public dirt lane not far from the house and still touching our property, a place I walked with the dogs all the time, and went maybe 40 feet up the bank into our part of the woods. It's a gorgeous spring day, the sun is shining and everything is beautiful. And I realize I don't hear any birds, no squirrels, absolutely nothing. Then I hear a rhythmic tapping noise coming from further up in the woods. I figured it was a woodpecker and I kept looking for plants, but it keeps making noise only when I walk and fall silent when I do. It keeps getting closer and starts walking to rustle leaves, waiting for this darn bird to appear. The noise finally gets close enough that I should see this devious woodpecker who doesn't sound entirely like a woodpecker anymore. There's nothing. Yet it keeps coming closer and closer, making what now sounds like someone slapping their thighs in rhythm. Now it's gotten even closer. And I realize whatever it is has been messing with me the entire time to get closer. And I have that moment that makes my insides feel like they've been melted. And I'm about to crap myself because that is dread, because there's something bad almost on me. And I flew through the woods and threw myself off the edge of the six foot bank straight out of the road. How I knew I'd be safe in the road, I don't know. I just felt like a boundary it wouldn't go on in my gut. It did follow me along the road for 20 feet into the woods till I came within line of sight of my house. I didn't tell anyone for years because I felt silly. And then one night I told my mum and little brother. He just looked at me and said, Why do you think I stopped going back there? It followed me once from the other side of the road. There is a man made reservoir located approximately three miles from my home, which spans generously over 650 acres of preserved state land. Along with boating, kayaking and fishing, a lot of people use the reservoir to walk as the massive lake is surrounded by at least five combined miles of hiking trails. Since moving to the area in 2004, I have spent a lot of time at that reservoir, which I never believed to be haunted until I had an experience there. I will never forget. It was late fall. So most of the leaves had already fallen off the trees, making it easier to see squirrels scampering away from the sound of my footsteps or birds flittering from branch to branch, hundreds of feet from the trail. At this point, I had been walking for about 45 minutes. So I was pretty far back into the woods and hadn't seen another person the entire time. On this particular trail, there is a landmark of sorts, a bench that I use to determine how far I've walked. And I usually turn back when I reach it. Just before the bench, there is a narrow fishing trail that leads to the reservoir's banks. As I crossed the fishing trail, I noticed the sudden appearance of an older man with shoulder length white hair, wearing a straw fishing hat, suspenders and blue jeans. 
He was carrying a rusty metal bucket in one hand, and a dog's leash in the other. I searched the spot that his gaze was fixated upon. The ground at the end of the leash. There was no dog to be found anywhere near the man. And the clip at the end of the leash was lying motionless in the dirt. Surprised yet not quite startled, I said to the man, Hello. His eyes turned towards me, but he said nothing. This was concerning to me because he seemed old enough to be my grandfather, and he was all alone in the woods. Are you all right? I asked the man stepping towards him. Again, he said nothing and did not move but continued to look me in the eye. I decided not to pester the man anymore. Surely, if he was in some kind of trouble, he would tell someone. I stumbled along in semi confusion towards the bench, the man now gone from my peripherals. When I reached the bench, I took a few minutes to stretch and take a swig of water, hoping that in that time the man would have crossed the trail and disappeared into the forest. Much to my surprise, as I approached the fishing trail once again, I still saw the man and his eyes were once again cast down to the end of the leash. I kept my eyes from making contact with him this time, directing my focus on the fallen leaves and snarling branches in front of me. As I crossed the fishing trail once again, I could feel the man's eyes turn towards me, but I did not return his gaze. Instead, I waited until I had crossed the path and could look at him from a distance through the mostly barren trees. Underneath the brim of the man's straw hat was a grey complexion contrasted by glowing yellow eyes looking straight into my soul. I could hardly believe what I was seeing, and it suddenly felt as if all my breath had been stolen away by the wind. I stared back for a moment, and then instinct took over, turning my crunching steps into panicked strides. Every few seconds I glanced back at the yellow eyes, hoping I'd imagined them to no avail. They remained present, until I had gotten far enough away and the density of the trees obscured them completely. What the hell was that? All I could think of was that question while I slammed my feet along the trail. I racked my brains for any and all logical explanations for what I had just seen, and came up with one that made some kind of sense. This man, definitely not a ghost but a man, had probably been fishing at the bottom of the trail and got tired on the way up explaining his need to take a break. He probably isn't much of a people person and didn't want to have a meaningless conversation with me. I get it. As for his eyes glowing yellow, maybe the sun was catching them in a certain way. The more I reasoned, the more confused I became and could no longer remember how long I had been running. As I rounded a corner, I almost ran into another hiker and nearly jumped out of my skin at the sight of her. Hi, the hiker said cheerily as she passed. I returned her greeting, then turned toward her and said, Wait, um, this is going to sound insane, but I don't think you should walk down there. She froze, now noticing my bewildered expression and said, What happened? I breathed deeply, and spoke my truth about what I saw to this stranger, fearing that I would sound absolutely bonkers. Surprisingly enough, she believed my story, but found no reason to believe that the man I had seen was something paranormal. Instead, we walked together to the end of the trail, and used an emergency phone to contact the reservoir's ranger on staff to whom we told about a man in the woods possibly needing medical assistance. We followed the ranger to the spot that I had seen the man, and told him that I would rather not go with him. The other hiker and I waited for the ranger to return, and when he did he looked disappointed and irritated. There was no one there, miss, the ranger said with exhaustion. Well, I'm sorry to bother you. 
It just seemed like he needed help. He really didn't look well, I retorted. The ranger left, and the hiker and I made small talk for a few minutes before I said, Do you think it's possible what I saw wasn't human? Confusion swept over her face for a moment, before she realized what I meant and then said, You definitely looked like you saw a ghost when you passed me on the trail. It's been years since these events transpired, yet I still find myself peering down the same fishing trail each time I pass it, expecting those yellow eyes and that twisted grey expression. I have never had another paranormal experience at this location, though I have sensed the presence of others many times while hiking here. Years ago, when I was 13 years old, I went on a trip to celebrate Easter with my mum's family. It was a tradition for us to go have a picnic in the middle of a big field, 40 minutes from my grandma's house. The field is basically in the middle of nowhere in rural Mexico. That day, my cousins and I got very curious about a small hill we could see from the field. It always caught our attention because it looks like a giant took a big bite out of it. I know it used to work as a rock mine several years prior. And anyway, we decided to go investigate and left the picnic. We walked for 20 minutes until we crossed a road and went up a hill. Once there, we started looking for a way to trespass a metallic fence that kept us from going into the actual mine and eventually we found a hole in it. My cousin was recording with her cell phone as we were making jokes and acting like normal cringy teenagers. When suddenly she froze and whispered, Hey, there's something in the rocks. And she pointed her camera to the rock wall behind us. At first I thought she was joking, but something about her expression seemed off. So I turned back and there was a human dog-like hybrid looking at us from a hole in the rocks, about 20 to 30 meters above the ground. It had pink, pale, and wrinkly skin, and a long snout and long ears, white eyes, and hands with long fingernails. It had no hair, and it kept still just watching us. After what felt like an eternity, the weird creature finally went into the hole again, and we started running back to the picnic spot. We showed the video to our family right after being scolded for going so far without saying anything to anyone, but you could barely see anything on the video. After all these years, I still don't know what that thing was, and I get goosebumps when I think about it. The mother of my best friend had a brother working on that mine in the 70s or so, and she claims that he and other workers died there but the families never got the bodies back. Apparently rocks collapsed multiple times, killing the people working and making it very difficult to retrieve the corpses. Well, that's what the owners of the mine said to all the families involved. After a few incidents, they decided to close the mine for good. I was in Big Bend National Park about 20 years ago prepping for a backpacking series presentation for REI. Big Bend is the western portion of Texas that dips towards along the bend of the Rio Grande that forms the border with Mexico. It's mixed high desert and smaller mountains. Gorgeous place, great history. I was hiking the area near Santa Elena Canyon probably a couple of hours before sunset, to try and get pics for the presentation. This area of the park opens into a comparatively flat section of the basin, where the river broadens and the wildlife tends to be more diverse and obvious. I was several hundred meters away from my van, which was parked in a designated lot at what passed for a trailhead at the time. As I approached the river basin near the mouth of my canyon, I saw something really unusual. So unusual, in fact, it took a few seconds for my brain to sort the puzzle. Something was moving on the other side of the river. 
and it was big, man-sized, but low to the ground, the colour of a deer, perhaps, and shuffling along. It looked, for first impression, to be a medium-sized white tail, though, lying on its side and moving like a snake. But that's not a thing that happens, so I moved in a bit to improve my line of sight. It was a mountain lion, a big cat, a very big cat. It was creeping along, low slung, hunting something that was probably no more than a stone's toss from where I was standing. I'd never seen one before, and when the visual information finally passed, I think my blood froze. Then it looked at me. I'll probably never forget that bit. You could see that little calorie calculator turn on in its eyes. I've never been so thankful for a river in my life. Granted at this time, and maybe still, the river was very low due to the drought, and unauthorized and unlawful irrigation practices upstream, and you could likely cross at several points at this location with minimal risk. But it was still quite broad, and definitely looked like part of a potent water barrier. Death Kitty does a series of double takes, head shifting from me to whatever the prey location was back and forth rapidly. Said calorie calculator and risk calculator trying to get a fix on this evening's menu. I die a little inside, maintain my facing, and begin slowly and quietly moving away. Not sure if I was worth it, if the river was too much of an X factor, or if the big un just really wasn't that into me. But no chase was given, and after breaking line of sight, I was able to get back into the van just fine with no signs of pursuit, and some mild trachycardia. That was the longest short walk I've ever taken. Later that night I was parked off the main park road, in an area where big cats commonly hunted. I'll always remember being parked there in the middle of nowhere, munching on slightly stale Oreos and a bottle of water, listening to the occasional growl or scream of a big cat peel out of the darkness, and being thankful for my relatively fortunate position on the food chain. Also, one night while I was on NyQuil, I hallucinated after getting a respiratory illness and woke up screaming. At a mountain, at 3am, at the public campsite, but that's someone else's scary story. About a year ago, I was out back with my family. It was around 8, and the sun was setting. We lived in a farmhouse in the middle of nowhere. The closest neighbour lived far away and something down the field kept catching my eye, but I ignored it at first. My sister saw it too, and kept looking out towards the trees. She was getting freaked out about it. My mum said to go investigate, so me and my sister started to walk across the field towards the tree line. Big mistake. It's hard for me to describe, this was the most terrifying thing that has ever happened to me. I didn't see it at first, and I didn't understand why my sister was so scared, until we were about a hundred yards away, when I saw this creature. Tall, probably eight to nine feet tall, white, humanoid with an elongated head, and no face. It had long arms and peeked around the trees. We stopped in our tracks. We couldn't tell what it was. It took a few steps further out of the trees and swayed back and forth, looking at me like a praying mantis. Me and my sister ran screaming back to the house, where my mum stood, jaw dropped. She'd seen it too. I had never been so scared in my life. We grabbed the binoculars and watched this terrifying creature peek in and out of the tree line, spying on us. My grandma thought we all had a wild imagination. 
The sun was almost gone now. And it was getting really dark. And the darker it got, the more it moved. Back and forth along the trees. It was terrifying. So we went in for the night and locked everything up tight. I couldn't sleep that night. I was hearing scratching on the roof. And at one point, a very loud bang and various noises coming from the barn. I was very afraid that I would wake up to my animals missing. The next morning, my grandma asked if we had heard the loud bangs outside that night. She ended up taking my grandpa with her on her morning walk. I have no idea what it was, and it still haunts me to this day. This happened two years ago in Oregon. It was my birthday in April. We took a trip deep woods hiking and camping, as that was my favorite thing to do. I also remember this incident well, as this was a time when my wisdom tooth was flaring up and I was in pain, not excruciating, but certainly annoying. We had spent the day driving around the woods and hiking when nightfall had started to set in. It had rained all day, sometimes hard, and other times barely a mist. But as the sun started to set, you could tell there was a nasty spring storm rolling in. We drove up a remote forest road that hadn't been maintained in what seemed like years. The trees had grown into the road and scraped against the vehicle but we liked camping off the beaten path to avoid humans. We had come to an area where the road widened on the top of the butte and was surrounded by second growth forest and some scattered old growth trees. We stopped the car and prepared the car for sleeping. I don't sleep in a tent anymore. I flat out refuse. We had sat in the car listening to the wind pick up and it was going to be a nasty storm. The trees were rocking, and it was a bit unnerving. Being on a high point on the terrain made the wind a bit worse. We had the windows down, as there was more wind, and the rain was only a drizzle. That night wasn't particularly cold, so it was comfortable to have the windows down. That's when I started to hear the noises. Every so often I'd hear what sounded like two men talking off in the woods. You can hear it more clearly from my side of the car, when the wind calmed down in between gusts. You could kind of hear it when the wind picked up though, more drowned out. I could tell whatever it was making these sounds was off at a distance. You couldn't make out anything they were saying. It sounded like they were having a very continuous conversation though, as there were never any breaks in the noise. My roommate was talking, and I asked him to stop for a moment and listen. He then heard the voices, and didn't know what to make of it. Then things got ugly, at least my fear level shot to that point. We started to hear what sounded like a baby crying off in the distance on my roommate's side of the car. That for some reason, made me absolutely nauseous. It's the middle of nowhere, pitch black outside, and all these noises are not your typical crickets, and are louder than the winds of the storm. As these noises seemed to get closer, we decided we'd had enough, and drove in the direction of leaving this forest road. When we got to about two miles down the road, it intersected with a more maintained forest road, and we stopped there to organize all the stuff, as we had gotten comfortable, leaving blankets on us and food out. As we sat there, organizing the stuff, we heard the sound of people talking at a distance. Then they stopped altogether. We sat there in silence for 15 minutes, and you could hear something running down the road from behind the car. It ran right up to the car faster than anything I'd ever seen. It's like it floated, and this huge black mass comes right up to the driver's side window. That's when my roommate floored it, and we took off. I couldn't see any details of this creature, as it was pitch black outside, 
but it was extremely large and dark. The mass was like an upright cow running up to your car. We ended up getting to the main highway and drove another half hour down the ridge and camped elsewhere. By then we were exhausted. Nothing happened at the new location, but I was on edge. It was a birthday I'll never forget. I still deep wilderness hike, but with protection. And even then I still feel intimidated at times. As you're walking, you seem to feel fine. But when you stop for a break, you catch that feeling sometimes like something is staring daggers through you from the tree line. We live in New Jersey. And if you're familiar with the magazine Weird and Jay, then you'll know all about Clinton Road. For those of you who don't, Clinton Road is a road in West Milford, New Jersey, that's 10 miles of pure dark and winding of road in the middle of the woods, with no street lights and no houses the entire way. It's considered the most haunted road in America, and is a popular spot for teens and young adults to look for a scare. Popular urban legends of the area are ghosts, satanic rituals and KKK gatherings in the woods, hybrid animals, and a spot where mafia hitman Richard Iceman Kuklinski would dump his bodies. So my friend and I took a trip there one time, and he's driving down the road and he swears he saw a fat guy with his face covered in face paint or makeup in his underwear, walking on the side of the road. Another time he said he found a red phone booth just like the ones in Britain, if not an exact replica, with an ominous purple or dark blue light shining from it. Wyoming is one of the largest states in America, covering nearly 98,000 square miles. Despite its size, Wyoming has less than 600,000 residents, making it one of the least populated states in the US. Its history is rich, and is as dark as the coal that fills the endless stream of boxcars winding their way across the western plains. Many battles and a great deal of blood has been shed by both the white man and the Native Americans in the fight over the lands and its resources. So as you can well imagine, many residents believe the land is cursed. There are countless stories of paranormal activity, from ghost encounters, Bigfoot sightings, to skimwalkers and cryptids alike not to mention stories of UFOs and alien abductions. This story, however, is not about spirits or anything of that nature. As a kid, my family would often go camping at Lake Desmet, just outside of Buffalo. These camping trips often included taking the boat out for some water skiing and or fishing. On one particular trip, my father and I were fishing in the middle of the lake. The water was so calm and still, it almost resembled glass. The glare from the midsummer sun's reflection off the water was nearly blinding. Still, we talked lazily about everything and nothing. I recall my father commenting on the fact he thought it was rather strange the fish were not biting at all. He stated it as if something had scared them away. I didn't give what he said much thought, as I was preoccupied by the sudden ripples that began to dance across the water, giving the lake's surface a funhouse mirror effect. I recall thinking it was rather odd for this to be occurring, considering there was no boat or anyone in sight for that matter. My heart began to pound in my chest, as the ripples soon turned to waves that slapped against the side of the boat, with enough force to cause it to rock back and forth. Judging from the look on my father's face, I could tell he too was feeling uneasy about the current situation. Dad, are you seeing this? I asked, trying to keep the fear from creeping into my voice. I am, is all he could say his eyes nervously scanning the lake. 
I should point out that the lake is said to have a depth of 70 feet on average, and 130 feet at its deepest. Others say no one knows how deep it truly is. There are countless stories regarding a creature known as Smeti. Descriptions of the cryptid are as varied as the sightings. Some describe it as a giant eel with a horse-like head, while others say it resembles an enormous alligator. Most witnesses describe the monster as a classic Loch Ness monster-style creature. Now keep in mind, I had heard all of the stories and truly believed they were just tall tales. However, all the doubt I had was blown out of the water as I watched what looked like the head and neck of a massive sea monster rise out of the depths, about 50 yards from the boat. As we watched in silence, the creature lazily drifted across the water as if it didn't have a care in the world. Needless to say, my father and I were peeing ourselves with excitement and fear. It was my father that first broke the silence. Well, I'll be damned. It does exist. Yeah. Neither of us had thought to bring a camera, so there was no way to capture a picture of the encounter. To be honest, even if we would have, we were both so shaken I doubt either of us would have gotten a decent picture at all. We just sat there staring in awe and disbelief for what seemed like hours. In truth, the whole encounter lasted maybe all of two minutes, before the lake creature disappeared beneath the lake's surface. My father and I looked at one another without speaking, and quickly began reeling in our lines. Well, I guess I know why the fish weren't biting, I pointed out. Indeed, my father replied, with a slight shiver. I think it's time for us to get the hell out of this lake, he suggested. I nodded my head in agreement, and without another word to my father, cranked the boat's motor, and we hauled ass back to shore, cautiously keeping an eye out for the monster. I've been back to Lake de Smet many times since, and have yet to see the creature again. However, sightings and stories continue to circulate. Although there is no actual proof that Smeti exists, I know without a doubt that it indeed does. If any of you have seen it or heard about this elusive creature, I would love to hear from you down below. My family and I have been hunting the same property in East Texas for over 10 years, and we've had some really creepy encounters with one of the locals. The property we hunt on is timber company land. It's way off the beaten path down some dirt roads. No power, no running water, no sewer. There are very few people that live in the area. Only a few scattered hunting camps and some locals. Our closest neighbours live in a trailer about a mile away, who we've come to call the Meth House. Now I'm not sure if there really is any meth going on there, but it would be hard to believe there isn't. This place has always been odd. There is a trailer sitting in the middle of a pine clearing. The brush is fairly overgrown around the trailer, almost as if the property is abandoned. There have always been broken down cars and other junk strewn throughout the front. Cow skulls and hip bones are attached to a pine tree in front of the house, going up about 15 to 20 feet. It started out with maybe 10, and over the years has grown to about 20. For a long time, I thought that was the oddest thing about the place. 2017, things started to get weirder. The front yard collection began to grow. A rotted out taxidermy of a wild hog was added to the skull tree. A doll head was fixed with horns and some kind of gown and mounted on a stick by the side of the dirt road that we called the baby devil. Tripods standing about 12 feet high each were erected around the trailer made out of young pine tree trunks. One day we drove by, 
and noticed that from these tripods hung the spinal column and rib cages of some animals. We originally thought that maybe they were using the tripods to hang and clean deer, but the same bones hung for over a year, and someone would usually want to dispose of the leftover carcass, because the smell can get overwhelmingly fierce very quickly. So, we had no encounters with the residents, and weren't even sure what they looked like. The place was creepy, but they kept to themselves, until later in the season, where we had two separate creepy encounters. The first happened to a good friend. He had made a quick day trip with his wife up to the property, to fill feeders and ride four wheelers. To get to his spot, he had to go on the dirt road, and drive right past the meth house. His spot is only a few hundred yards away from the house. While they were doing their thing, they began to hear some strange noises. As he listened closer, he could hear fast, high-pitched gibberish, back and forth, between two voices. He described it as a lot of yips, yars, and yees, and the word Jesus mixed in. They decided to get on one of the four-wheelers and investigate. They found two men squatted down, picture Gollum Lord of the Ring style, besides a large mud puddle in front of the house. They were splashing and bouncing around, while furious and loudly speaking gibberish. Once they noticed the four wheelers, they in unison stopped talking, and stared like an animal that has been spooked. My buddy took off on the four wheeler, and didn't look back. The second semi-encounter happened to me and my brother. We were up there alone for this weekend, and were relaxing by the fire on a pitch black night after a long day's hunt. We began to hear something strange off in the distance. It was pipe organ music. There were missed notes and sporadic stops and starts. We laughed about how this seems like the setup in a horror movie, and tried to ignore it. The music continued on and off for the next few hours, then all of a sudden we hear crashing through the brush. This was very thick brush, about 10 feet high and 100 feet or so deep, in between our camp and the direction of the house. This didn't sound like the usual spooked deer, armadillo rooting around, or hogs coming down the trail. It was a crash made by something large, and it was close. The rest of the night was quiet, no more organ music and no more noises in the woods. Likely, just a local little old lady practicing her organ for Sunday service the next morning, drifting over for another property. Likely it was some animal that got spooked crashing through the brush, but we sure were freaked. We made a point to not be alone overnight ever again, and kept a close eye on that house from now on. When I was around 10 years old and feeling adventurous, I would go riding my bike down my parents' road, which was dead-ended two miles down at the only neighbor's house, or exploring around in the endless acres of pasture surrounding our house. We were way out in the boonies. The back of one pasture sloped down to a slough slash creek, which fed into a small pond in our neighbor's pasture. The area had some woods around it, and I decided it was a good place to return to play. The neighbors were an older couple who had lived in the area for years and never really went anywhere, and I didn't think they would mind if I played there. One day I was playing around the pond and found a lot of mussels, like oysters, buried in the mud. I dug a couple and took them home. A few days later in the same spot, it looked like a lot more had been dug up, and they had been opened and eaten, which would be okay for a raccoon or something, but there were some big boot prints that couldn't possibly have been mine. I should have had a lot more sense, but I kept going back after finding things. Once there was a plastic bag full of trash, some ripped up clothes and a tarp. They were still down there next time I came back, and I heard a car coming down the road. 
I laid my bike down and hidden the slough. It was dried up at this point about four feet deep, on the other side of the pond. And a man pulled up coming from the neighbor's end of the road in a black boxy looking car, maybe a Cadillac, and got out wearing a suit. He grabbed the trash bag and clothes and threw the bones in a hole, looked around, got back in the car and headed out of there quickly. I went back after he left and looked at the bones and took one of them home. I pedaled as fast as my short stubby legs would go. My dad said it looked like a deer or cow bone and threw it out. It wasn't until I started studying pre-med in college that I realized it was a human radius, likely that of a woman or older child. This happened to me when I was in grade six, 10 years ago, around September. At recess and lunch, we went outside on nice days. The schoolyard consisted of two playgrounds, a soccer field and a baseball field surrounded by a wooded area. We were not supposed to go into the woods, but there were a few monitors out keeping an eye on a hundred or so kids. On this particular day, my friend Courtney was in the woods and came running back telling me and my other friend Justin to follow her in. A couple of meters in there sat a tent and a middle aged man sitting nearby. We're a little freaked out, but the guy immediately explained to us that he was homeless and hungry. Us thinking we were clever, asked to see his ID to know if we could trust him. I remember his first name was Justin, the same as my friend. And after this, we left with the impression that homeless Justin was a nice guy. So the next day we decided to pack some extra snacks for recess to give to homeless Justin. For the next three days, we brought homeless Justin food and had brief visits with him. We tried to keep him a secret for the other kids, but being so young, we weren't so good at hiding that we were sneaking into the woods each recess. On the last day I saw Justin, he told us that these woods weren't big enough and asked if there were any bigger woods around the area for him to live in. Wanting to help, I explained that there were in fact deep woods near my house, a five minute walk away. After school, Courtney and I walked him there as Courtney lived up at the top of the hill closer to the woods. So when I got to my house, I left to go home and for Courtney to bring him up to the top where the path to the woods began. Now this man never actively tried to hurt myself or my friends, but Courtney came and told me the next day at school that the police had found them at the top of the hill and arrested homeless Justin. Courtney and I still aren't sure how they found out what was happening and where they were going. And the next day at school, the principal came into our class extremely angry that we had been foolish enough to help a random dude living in the woods. But our young minds couldn't wrap our head around why. So we decided to Google Justin's name. Turns out local news had published that he had murdered his girlfriend and son and was on the run from police. So random guy living in the woods behind my elementary school. Let's not meet again. About 15 years ago, my parents, my brother and I were driving around the countryside looking for a way back to the highway after going to see a house outside of the city. The vegetation is mostly tall grass and dead trees, and the dirt road isn't lit at all, which at night gives the surroundings a kind of eerie feeling. My dad's Nissan Primera, it's making his way through the countless deserted crossroads, and we are lost as hell because there was no GPS back then. As we are arriving at another crossroads, we see there's something in the middle of the road. It looks like a baby carriage. As we get closer, my father slows down on the side of the carriage and my mother starts shouting. There in the middle of the road is a beat up baby carriage on its side and we can hear a baby crying. My mum is going, my God, the baby, get the baby. 
and as she goes to open her door, my dad punches in gear and does one of those movie moves where the car slides a bit and does a gravel kick. He basically wants to haul ass out of there. My mother is still crying and screaming, her door half open, and my brother and I look back just in time to see four guys jump out the tall grass on the side of the road, holding planks and baseball bats and other weapons. We eventually find our way to the highway and stop at a gas station right at the entrance. My father tells the gas station attendant what we just saw, and the dude goes, Oh yeah, those guys. They're always doing that to steal cars and money. They basically put a baby doll in a carriage, and when you stop the car, they jump out the bushes and jack you for all you've got. We never went back to that region after that. I was visiting my cousin's house. I have four cousins, two twin girls aged 10, and then the older brother aged 21, and other older brother aged 26. I was sleeping in the room with the cousin of my age, 21. We heard things falling in the girl's room, right next to where we were. We assumed it was just them playing. But one of them started talking to the other, and they were across the room. So my cousin stepped out of the room to go check, and I watched over his shoulders through the doorway. Right as the girls were explaining that stuff was falling without provocation, a sort of humanoid type thing came bursting out the closet. It looked human-esque, but was much longer and thinner and ran on all four legs. It ran out the house, broke the front door hinge, and straight through the screen door. We called the police immediately, and they were there within five minutes. They looked in a five mile radius and nothing was found. They gathered DNA from the door, as apparently the thing was cut by shattering wood on the door, as there was still a small amount of blood on it. They ran tests, and it was determined to be inconclusive. They said it was similar to human DNA, but not in the way ape DNA is similar. It wasn't a human though, they knew that much. So to this day, we have had no incidents with whatever this thing is. They still live in the house, have no problems, but we have zero explanation for what happened, and what the thing was, and how it got into the house. This story happened when I was working the 150 mile line between Nashville and Chattanooga, Tennessee. I was working a local job on that run called the Coan Pusher, with the mountain grade starting at Coan basically going all the way down to Chattanooga. It can be a very difficult stretch of railroad. I had the third shift on the cow and pusher. It was all I could hold even if I didn't enjoy working nights. We basically just sat in the shop and waited to be called to help tonnage trains get to Sherwood, Tennessee. Now, all I can say about Sherwood is picture the hills have eyes with banjos added in. On the night in question, it was around 11.50pm when a heavy freight train stopped over at Sherwood and requested our help to get over the other side of the mountain. We climbed on the engines and got on our way. By the time we hit Coan, and started curving up the foot of the mountain, we had no visibility of anything that wasn't illuminated by the locomotive light. We had a 30 minute ride ahead of us, along with a two mile long dark tunnel in our path. As the clock struck midnight, we were now in the middle of nowhere, surrounded by woods filled with wolves, rattlesnakes, 
and a few mountain folk. Most of the mountain folk are nice, but don't let the sun set your ass in those woods. About ten minutes later, the north portal of the tunnel was in sight. A bridge hung over the entrance. A branch line that was taken up long ago crossed it, going to another part of the mountains. The bridge is still accessible by ATV. As I looked up, I saw a campfire and people. They all looked to be dressed darkly, perhaps even in mask, and all I could see were their white faces. As we started under the bridge, we heard a thud over our heads on the locomotive roof. We proceeded through the dark tunnel, and slowed just out of the south portal, as the conductor looked out the back door with his flashlight. He saw nothing, so we shrugged our shoulders and proceeded on the last ten minutes on our waiting train. It was twelve twenty a.m., and we coupled on the rear of the train to push it from Sherwood. As the engineer on the head end entered the south portal of the tunnel, he radioed back to me, talking about figures standing over the tunnel entrance. However, no one was there. As it came in my sight, as we exited the north portal, I looked to the best I could to see on my side of the tracks for whatever had hit our roof. I saw what looked like a black cloak fluttering in the wind as we passed, but couldn't really tell. As we entered Cowan, we uncoupled on the fly, and the train continued to Nashville. We cruised on into our parking track, and tied our engines down. As we got off, we had the feeling of being watched, but thought nothing as we parked our asses in the office chairs. We had no more work for the rest of our shift. We just talked and napped on and off until three a.m. We never did shake the feeling of being watched, so we stepped outside as I put a pinch of dip in my lip, and my conductor lit a cigarette. As we both laughed with each other, we noticed movement in the brush across the tracks. Now I must remind you that both my conductor and myself. A big country boys who don't scare easy. We went over to investigate. We found three hooded men in the bushes, with a huge spot of my tobacco. I asked them, "What are you doing here? You understand you're trespassing on railroad property, right?" The lead guy then spoke up in a demonic, gravelly tone. "We just want what's ours." As he said this. He motioned to the top of the locomotive. We looked to see a young man on the roof at the air horn. The young man was in nothing, not even underwear. And as we all looked at him, he bolted from the roof, climbed off, and ran down the tracks. As this happened, the figures turned to chase. The lead guy then turns his head back towards us with glowing eyes that we could now see. He. Hustled, stared at us, and gave chase with his friends. We called the cops, and after hours of investigation, they found the man's underwear, with no traces of him or the cloaked individuals. We even took them up the mountains. Cops love free train rides. There was nothing. Now, on occasion, we find dead animals by the shop door or locomotive, mutilated. I've even found one or two at my door at home. We still occasionally see that same fire on the bridge, and get the feeling of being watched, but it's all gone by the time we return. I'm sure there's a cult somewhere on that mountain. Earlier this summer, I was hiking in the 100-mile wilderness in Maine. A couple of days into my trip, I got really sick: sore throat, headache, fatigue, loss of appetite, about the worst cocktail of symptoms for hiking any long distance. I had found a tick on me and was terrified I might have Lyme disease. I decided to get off trail and see a doctor, 
which is easier said than done in the most remote, inaccessible sections of the whole Appalachian Trail. Thankfully, there are old logging roads which crisscross the wilderness. So I decided to turn off onto a road which I was told led to a campground. There I hoped to find some day hikers and get a ride into town. As soon as I turned off the Appalachian Trail, it started pouring with rain, which only increased my misery. A few minutes later, I noticed a dog in the woods. Strange, I thought. Then I saw another dog, and another, and another, and about a dozen big hunting hounds fenced off randomly in the middle of nowhere, Maine. They barked at me, slavering, and pawed at the chicken wire fence, which did not seem strong enough to hold them. This was slightly disconcerting, but the brown trouser moment came when I spotted a lone figure in the woods what seemed to be a tall man in a hooded blue rain jacket and pants. I couldn't see his face, and he just stood there, still as a statue, severely spooked. I hiked out of there on the double. In the backcountry, it's generally good manners to say hello and exchange pleasantries. But this guy didn't say a word. Maybe it was because of the rain. Maybe he was feeding bodies to his hounds out there. I'll never know. But he definitely saw me, and I could tell that he was watching me go past. Back in 2001, I was 21, working in a hotel bar 10 miles from my home. This was on Christmas Eve. I had to work that night. The hotel was open and I was the new kid on the job, so I had to. I closed the bar at 2am, went to change my clothes, and went to my motorcycle. It was really cold at the time, so sometimes I would take a very narrow country road that cutted my trip almost to half, which was only used by residents of a few houses. I used it as I could exit near the main road on the motorcycle. A car could not. It was me and my friend from work on the motorcycle, and after maybe a mile in said road, in the middle of nowhere, near one of the houses, I saw something when passing by the house gate. I then stopped maybe 60 to 80 feet from the house gate. We both looked back, and there it was, like straight out of a movie. The typical Hollywood alien. It looked 6.5 to 7 feet tall, with grey skin, the oval face, the dark eyes, the complete package. We stared at it for 10 seconds, and it stared back at us. Then I proceeded to get the hell out of there. We both agreed to ourselves that it was just an idiot in a costume. For the next few years, I told this story to some close friends and family, just like I'm telling you now. We then went to separate jobs, but would occasionally see my friends, and we would always share a laugh about it. But we would always say, what the hell was a guy doing in an alien costume at 2am on Christmas in the middle of nowhere, in those pitch black woods? Now I'm 36 years old, and I'm a science kind of guy. I do believe that we are not alone, but I find it hard to believe 99% of the stuff we read. I would still like to think it was just an idiot in a costume, but I will forever think, what the hell? This story has been passed down through my family. They called it the Indian's Devil. All I know is that my great 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 grandfather was courting his wife and had to walk 12 miles up the old island road. The story goes that something jumped out of the trees at him. It had the hands and feet and face of a man, but the body of an ape. It followed him for miles, mocking him and then running away. 
The local Aboriginal people call it a devil, and always told their children to stay close or it might snatch them. They knew this thing. So I asked Grampy what happened, and he said that my great-great-great-grandpa was so upset that he took to his bed for four days. He then got a bunch of men together and they tracked it down and shot it. This happened about 26 years ago. My friend Jack and I were driving an RV, pulling an old truck bed conversion trailer to Yucca Valley. He made a deal with a friend of ours to trade his RV for a running truck. We were driving on old highway 247, where there was nothing, just flat sand and an occasional rock formation. I remember we passed a rolling sand hill overlooking winding roads of nothing, and it was dark. I was laying on the side couch, taking a nap, while he called out for me to come up front and look at what he was seeing. They looked like lit balls of red fire darting past each other, going up and down about a mile ahead of us, and they seemed to be coming in our direction. As they got closer, we noticed that about four of them bunched together making one. Then four more joined them. Jack slowed down, and we were hoping they would go away, but they didn't. I opened the window, but we never heard a sound, and they just seemed to hover. Jack thought, screw it, and started driving faster. That's when they all dispersed and flew towards this rock hill, and Jack floored it. We were all freaked out. As we were driving, we heard a bang from the back of the RV. So we ran back there trying to keep our balance because Jack was driving like a bat out of hell. And when I looked out the back window, I saw the trailer with something sparkling in the middle of it. I turned my head to tell him, but by the time I turned back, there were flames right where the sparks were. At the time, the red lights were gone, just gone. Jack pulled over, grabbed the small fire extinguisher by the stove, and we stood by the door, but we were too scared to go outside. With a few exhales, he puffed up his chest, swung open the door and ran out the trailer. I had a big flashlight, and I trailed behind him. The flames were getting pretty big, lighting up the desert around us, and it took a while to put it out, as we were looking above and around us. Jack jumped in the trailer to see what had caught fire, but all he found was shard of pointed metallic pieces strewn around in a dent in the bottom of the trailer bed. I jumped at the trailer because I didn't want to be standing on the ground alone. Just then we heard something about 40 feet behind us on the passenger side. I shined my light, but we didn't see anything. It was quiet. Not a car or light in sight. We heard it again. It sounded like gravel, like when you scrape your shoe on dry dirt, but it was closer. Jack thought he saw something, so he took the flashlight. I, of course, was holding onto him so close, I could feel his heart thump through his ribs. He turned the light on, where we heard the noise, and it looked like around five piles of sand like little mounds in a row. Then the noise stopped. We started to jump out the trailer, and we heard it again. Jack beamed the light, and caught the flash of some reflective diamond-shaped eyes that quickly disappeared. Then those sandy dirt mounds began moving towards us at the same time, as if something small was pushing them from behind. Jack grabbed me. We jumped and run towards the RV doors, and I don't think either of us had ever run that fast before. He put the RV in drive and we sped off. We heard things hitting the back like rocks being thrown, but we didn't falter. We were constantly looking around, and I stayed right next to him. By the time we got to a small town, the RV was sputtering. Jack didn't understand why. It was in perfect shape before we left, so we pulled over to check the engine and under a street light, he took a walk around and saw that the hot tailplate had been curled up, like folded up facing the back of the bumper. 
When he looked up, he saw all of the back window screens were shredded and the rubber around the glass was hanging. He took some tools and some gloves and straightened the pipe and we drove a bit longer to our friend's house. We told our friend what happened, but he didn't believe us. The next day when we woke up, our friend came in asking what the hell we did to the RV. So when we looked at it, it looked like the glass was etched with scratches up where the screens were shredded. We had no explanation as to what could have cut glass like that. And there were dents on the top and the back. In one spot on the side, there was what looked like an impression of five fingers with nail holes at the end of them and a wide thumb. Needless to say, Jack had to pay our friend for the damage to the RV. And we took his new truck and drove the long way back home. And we never spoke about it to anyone again. He kept a few of those metallic shards. He said that when he held them, it felt soft. But when he accidentally dropped it, it turned sharp and hard again. He told me that he had to get rid of them. Because the more he handled them, the more he noticed his hands would start to blister. And he didn't want his kids to get a hold of it. I kick myself now. Because if I had known back then it was so significant, I would have asked him to let me keep them. Five years ago, it was daytime. And I was driving with my son in my small truck. We were following my ex in his car. And we ended up in that same spot. It didn't dawn on me that we were going that way. I started to hyperventilate and my son had to calm me down. You see, it was times like this that really made me hate the desert. Living in the Green Mountain National Forest in Vermont, I've seen and heard tons of weird stuff. One time, I was walking down the road and found a coyote skull, with the eyes still intact, sitting in the road. It had mostly been stripped by birds at this point. But I'll never forget the eyes. It was April. And my best guess was that it got trapped in the snow that winter, died. And as soon as it started melting, other animals decapitated it and left it in the road. Now, I've had some stuff happen to me that I can't explain. I was walking on a seldom used abandoned settlement trail in the early spring, when the least amount of hikers around. I was 17 at the time. As I headed up the trail, I could hear a distinct humming in the woods a little bit away from me. It sounded like a woman, but no one should have been out there at the time. It's a trail that's rarely ever used in the summertime, when people are out and about in the woods. It also, at first, seemed far enough away that whoever it was couldn't see me, making the chances of it being someone messing with me almost zero. For a while, I kept walking, telling myself it was something natural, like a stream of water running against the snow and rocks. But every time I stopped, it stopped too. When I would continue on, it would get louder. I got a terrible feeling in the pit of my stomach and turned on my heel back the way I came towards my car. I think I was probably a half mile in at this point, And something in my brain told me to run. And I took off, even though the snow was pretty difficult to move quickly through. I swear something was running along beside me in the woods, keeping pace, but I was too afraid to even glance at the tree line. I got into my car as quickly as possible, and stared back at the trail. I didn't see anything, but I felt like something was watching me, and I got out of there fast. A few years back, my girlfriend at the time and I were on a week long motorcycle trip during the summer, hotel hopping. We stopped in a major ski resort town, which is a complete ghost town during its off season for one of our stays, because close by, there were multiple hiking attractions, one of them being a major ski resort itself. 
During the summer, you can ride the lift to the top of the mountain, and from there, supposedly take a 20 minute hike that overlooks the entire valley. We never got there. We arrive at this practically abandoned looking ski lodge, maybe had six cars in the parking lot if that, and no one was there to greet us as we walked in. We kind of aimlessly walked around the lodge and finally hear someone talking outside the chairlift. I approached the guy and asked about this hike that was offered. He was a seemingly nice man, told us the directions once at the top to walk straight back where you get off at, and there's a trail that bends to the left and follow it for 15 to 20 minutes. It's an easy walk, and you see the whole valley at an overlook at the end. I gave him the $10 or whatever the cost was to ride the lift. And this is where it gets creepy. As we get to the top, the guy manning the console steps out and gives us a friendly wave. Kind of a young hefty guy. He stops the lift and I immediately notice he must have had some severe social anxiety or was very intimidated by me. As I'm six foot two, 250 pound, tattooed and sleeveless wearing my leather riding vest. I'm used to people avoiding interactions with me. After stopping the chairlift, the guy turns back to me and just loses all color in his face like he's looking at the devil himself. He's so nervous he could hardly open the safety bar. So I pop it off and we hop off. I ask him about the trail and he manages to squeak out over there. He points directly in front of us. And then he giggles. He giggled like a kid sneaking candy in the back seat of a car. As weird as it was, I took it as nervous laughter and out of curiosity for his instant change of personality. I dragged my feet around the lift house and take in the view for a while trying to talk to this guy. I ask him a few questions just being friendly to show him that I mean him no harm. But he never bites for conversation and shoots back quick short answers. We go onto the trail, hike for almost an hour never seeing anything but woods. And we never made it to the outlook, but came to a clearing in a field surrounded with more trees and no more trail. Total bad vibe. We almost jogged back the way we came. We came out of the woods. And the same guy from earlier acts completely shocked we came back, almost like we weren't supposed to return. He asked us a bunch of questions about the trail, all while lightly giggling after each sentence. Then it seemed as if he was going to be in some sort of trouble and hurried us into the chairlift back down the mountain. I'm an avid hiker. This trail only has one entrance and one exit. And we walked it from end to end. And giggle monsters seem surprised to hear we came back to a clearing like he's never known about it. The guys at the bottom of the mountain acted just as surprised. Maybe the body van was running late. I don't know. But that place had a wrong turn vibe all over it. I was walking a trail alone one evening around a huge bluff that sticks up maybe 40 feet tall. The hike is a 1.5 mile hike. As I was on it, I got a call from my girlfriend at the time. So I answered and began to talk to her. It started to get dark. And I was dragging my feet along as we got chatting. All of a sudden, I started hearing rustling all around me. Growing up in a rural area of Illinois, I had a good sense of what was a pack of coyotes. I told my girl I was being followed and needed to have my wits about me. She was a little freaked but understood. I hung up and grabbed my pocket knife and found a stick I could whittle into a point as quickly as I could. As I'm walking down the trail, I could hear the rustling getting closer and closer, turning from stereo sound to 7.1 Dolby to put it plainly. At this point, I knew I was surrounded by them, but couldn't see them. I was on the cusp of a hill, and I wanted to get a good vantage point to defend myself if it were to come to that. As I get to the top of the hill, I notice a doe just over the ridge, 
maybe twenty yards past it. The rustling had stopped. Everything was quiet. I realized that the coyotes weren't after me, but clearly hunting this deer, which was odd to begin with. I finally yelled, and the deer looked back, saw me, and took off like a bat out of hell. The second the deer moved, four coyotes came from behind me and ran full sprint past me, practically scraping my jeans as they passed, and I came careening down the side of the bluff. I stood there for a few minutes, trying to figure out what the hell just happened. I haven't taken that trail since. It was pretty damn scary. I grew up in the woods, never had an encounter like that, and hope to never have one like that again. I'm originally from the Gulf Coast of Texas, and when I was a kid growing up there, it was very easy to go from the bustling bright lights of Houston to the dark, deserted country road in only a few minutes. Not so much the case now, but ask anyone who's been far out in the country, away from any city or town, and they'll tell you that it gets dark out there. You can see the Milky Way in all its glory, but unless the moon is full and bright, you can't see your hands in front of your face. When driving, all you can see is the area illuminated by your headlights. Everything else is swallowed by the gloom. My father's family is scattered around the Gulf Coast, including cousins that lived far out in the middle of nowhere. One night, my parents, my brother, and my eight-year-old self were returning from a visit from one of those cousins just a few days after Halloween of 1988. My brother and I were in the back seat, quietly talking about a show that we'd watched once trick or treating had been over with. The show had talked about a shape-shifting ghost that liked to take the form of oncoming headlights that never passed. And my brother and I were talking about how weird and creepy it would be to see something like that. Our dad then mentioned that he had seen those before, and that in the back roads of Texas were a hotbed of paranormal activity. No sooner had the words left his mouth, a mile or so ahead of us, a pair of headlights appeared facing us. None of us thought anything of it. Other than to laugh at the coincidence, it was nothing unusual to encounter another car or two at all hours of the night in such areas. We kept driving down the road, and with the four of us talking about various things, until my brother noticed the headlights, which were still facing us, and had not gotten any closer. Cue the sudden, total silence. Inside our family car, as we all stared at the headlights, we kept going down this completely dark, otherwise empty road, and those lights stayed the same distance away from us, never getting any closer, and never changing directions. I don't know how long we stared at them, but eventually, my brother and I began to get a little freaked out. And we ducked down out of sight behind the front seats. Not too long after that, Dad turned off that road, and floored it, and the rest of the drive home was made in total silence. I never saw anything like that again, even though we travelled up and down that road on many occasions after that. And a couple of years later. We ended up moving to Illinois to be closer to my mother's family. And while the back roads of Illinois can be creepy, I don't think I'll ever be able to forget seeing those headlights keeping pace with us, right after we discussed that very thing. This is a story relayed to me by my father many years ago. He was doing a road trip of the states. He was driving along one night, determined to stay up. He'd been driving for about five hours, 
and it was approaching midnight. Exhaustion and fatigue from the day had been getting to him, and he was starting to feel the strain at the wheel. Every moment was another fight against sleep, and he kept his eyes open, determined to stay awake, for his destination lied only a half hour away. He thought it best to pull over for a brief respite. So he pulled over on the side of the road. It was a fairly desolate place, and there were no other cars. He stopped, looked about, and it was pitch black. The moon was high in the sky, but other than that, it gave very little light for this surrounding area. He got out of his car, reached it into his pocket, and fumbled, retrieving a cigarette box, pulled out a cigarette and lit it. While sighing deeply, he really needed to make it that next half hour. As he stood there, thinking about what he was going to do tomorrow, and dreaming about the comfort of a bed for the night, did he hear something in the distance? He turned his head and didn't see anything, and just ignored it, assuming it was the sound of the wind. He finished his cigarette. He stood on the ember, and just as he was about to open the car door, did he look around again? That's when he saw it. The moonlight was reflecting, and there was something in the trees, something vaguely humanoid shape. He tried squinting. Was it a person that needed help? Why were they not approaching? But moreover, why were they standing there creepily, in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of the night? When he realized just how odd this was, did my dad quicken his pace, threw open the car door, and closed it, feeling safety within his vehicle? He didn't even do his seatbelt up. He tore us out of there quickly, and started making his way to his destination to get some sleep. He looked in his rearview mirror after a few seconds, and didn't see anything, and a surge of relief washed over him. As he carried on with his drive, did he occasionally glance in the mirror, and after a few minutes, he noticed it. It was following him. It was matching his speed. He was going at nearly 60 miles an hour. How could this creature be keeping up with him? My father thought he was going mad, but dared not stop to pinch himself and verify this. He put his foot on the accelerator and pumped that machine harder. 70, 80, 90 miles an hour. His car was now really suffering, yet this creature seemed not to stop. Its speed matched the whole time, and as my father was putting his foot further and further, to the point where it wouldn't speed up anymore, he swore he thought the creature was gaining on him. My father was absolutely bricking it. Fear, panic, and terror all consuming him within his mind. His glances back to the mirror were now frequent. His fear was overcoming him, his heart was racing, and he didn't know what to do. And just as quickly as it had started following him, did the creature vanish. It must have run off into a bush or something, or realised my father wasn't worth pursuing. He didn't stop. The speed he maintained he carried on for several hours. He decided to forget about his little hotel for the night and kept on driving until he reached his friend's place. He passed out when he reached his house, about 8am the next day. The fear fueled him all night, and he told me that he would never visit that part of the States again, and warned me that if I were to find myself down a lonely road in the middle of the night, to keep going, and to be wary of my surroundings. Who knows if that creature 
whatever it might be, is still out there. How it could reach those speeds, he doesn't know, and he doesn't want to find out. He's just grateful that he got out with his life. My sister is a very short and petite girl, and her fiance, a six foot guy who weighs more than 200 pounds, decided to do a little vacation type thing and rented a trailer out in the middle of nowhere. Sometime during their time there, this was around 1 or 2 am, they got into a bad fight and he stormed off to another part of the trailer and my sister was left feeling frustrated. All of a sudden she felt eerily calm. And then she said she got an image in her head of this clearing with rocks. And despite never having been there, she felt drawn to it and seemed to know how to get there. Like something wanted her to go there. So she put on her shoes and her fiance came out and asked her where she was going. She said she was going on a walk and then left. She told me she got about 50 yards from the trailer before she was hit with this extreme and heavy dread and fear and felt that if she went any further, she would die, but felt like she couldn't panic and run. So she tried her best to act calm and went back to the trailer walked inside, closed and locked the door behind her. And before her fiance had a chance to ask what happened, they both heard something fast, way too fast and heavy, run from the forest and towards the trailer. It ran all around and over the trailer before they heard it come up the steps to the door and stop. Her fiance grabbed a knife and was going to confront whatever it was. But she begged him not to and told him there was nothing he could do to hurt it. So they didn't. She didn't get any sleep that night. And when daylight came, nothing was out there. The scariest thing she said was that they never heard it. Whatever it was. Leave. I like to explore and fish a lot. They coincide a lot. So it's a pretty big passion of mine. I was hiking along a creek in a rural county near my home in some dense game lands about eight or so miles from any house, probably at least double that from a major road or settlement. I had hiked for a while and was hardly seeing any sign of human presence. Nearly every place I go in my state, I can find garbage, hunting trash, or any other sign that people have been there. If I see nothing, it is sort of a good sign that the area is undisturbed. As I was hiking, I heard gunshots far away. Not uncommon either, but the forest was oddly quiet. And yes, cliche incoming. I felt super uneasy, as if there was someone else there. Eventually, I found something really strange. And I've looked for the picture forever but can't find it. It was a small metal box. And I was well versed enough to know it was a geocatch out in the open at the base of a tree. Let me remind you, this is several miles through thick woods and no sign of human habitation or influence. The box was rusty and looked to have been through a lot. I tried opening it, but a lot of sediment and rust had accumulated and I got a little give, but nothing significant. There was definitely stuff rattling around. So I tried a ton and nothing would work. I realized it wasn't going to open. So I left it as I found it and put a piece of duct tape on the tree next to it to find it again. I left and went home downloaded the geocaching app, but the box wasn't registered anywhere. Nor were there really any geocaches along that creek at all, none registered for miles. So either it wasn't a geocache or maybe just really old. Anyway, the very next day I went back armed with a crowbar hammer and pliers. 
I went back to the exact spot it was in, as I had put the duct tape right around the ground besides the tree. But the box was nowhere to be found. I looked all around and couldn't find it, at which point several miles from civilization, and several more from cell service, I booked it out there. I realized that this isn't spooky or supernatural. But it put me on the edge more than anything else I've ever been through. I live in Pennsylvania, and have heard and found so many scary and creepy stories in this state. I'm not originally from here. And it also creeped me out to learn that Dave Politis said the entire state of Pennsylvania is a cluster. I live in the woods. There are a lot of beautiful woods here in Pennsylvania. And the seasons are so nice especially the beautiful fall colors. Like I said, I do live in the woods. And some creepy things happen here. I live on a very high cliff. And below are huge boulders, small caves, a creek, and miles of woods. It's beautiful, and peaceful. Yet sometimes creepy. I have a motion sensor light on the side near the cliff. And in the evening while doing the dishes or cooking, that light goes on and off an unusual amount of times. I always look out the window, but can never see what's setting it off. Of course, it could be bats the majority of the time. However, I have a German Shepherd. And at least a few times a month, she needs to go out to do her business, or she may hear something that she needs to investigate. Like most GSDs, she's very protective and guards very well. Sometimes I'll open the door and she will look out. Then her hairs will stand up along her haunches and spine. And she will back up and refuse to go outside. This is really creepy, especially if it's one of those evenings when that motion sensor light comes on a high number of times. This dog is very brave and extremely protective. She has never acted afraid of any person or animal. She has one focus to kill what comes in her yard or near her family. So when she does this thing, I tell you it scares me. And I certainly don't want to know what is scaring her. If anyone's dogs do this, I'd love to know. I've never had a dog do this before. Could it just be a smell? She's been sprayed by skunks and isn't afraid of smells as far as I'm aware. I'd appreciate anyone's input. Out back of my own 30 acre property, there is a big grove of eucalyptus trees. I was walking out there to get to the river because me and my friends were going to drink some beer and generally chill by the river. But when we walked by the trees that I've walked by thousands of times before with no weirdness, I thought I saw a little kid peeking out from one of the bigger trees. So, I told my friends to look right there where the kid or whatever it was, was hiding. And about a four foot tall humanoid thing peeked out with its pale white like grayish color. It had a weird head. And honestly, that's about as descriptive as I could be. As the moment I saw it, my hair stood up. And I ran as fast as I could back to my house to grab a gun. We still go past those trees to get to the river, but never do so without firearms. I wish I had not been so scared, because I feel like I should have filmed it. <laughs> 